we're now going to call to order the City of Winooski Liquor Control Board meeting. If you're here for the City Council meeting, you're not in the wrong place. We do have a Liquor Control Board meeting first though this evening, so we'll do that business very quickly. At about 6.05, we'll start the City Council meeting. So if you're waiting for an agenda item on that uh, area, we will be circling back there soon. Um, so first, I'll call to order the Winooski Liquor Control Board meeting with a regular meeting scheduled for Monday, November the 5th at 6 p.m. I uh, said everybody would please join us for the Pledge of Allegiance, led by Deputy Mayor Nicole Mays. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we have one item on tonight's liquor control board meeting, and that is for, for uh, consideration of first class license for Gauchel LLC DBA uh, Dale Boca or Dale Boca hmm, 20, uh, at 215 Main Street, formerly in the uh, Floating Building. Um, so, uh, this is a liquor license. We've Heather's met with the business owner, and we're excited to welcome them to this vacated property now. Floating is up on the top of Main Street. That's awesome. So we are very excited. It was cool news to see that they're coming in here. Do we have anybody from the business in this evening? Yes. yes. <laughs> How are you? It's all right. It's okay. <laughs> I hope no, that's uh, for the business. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> we'll just invite you now. We're considering your license. Anything that you guys want to say? And, and most importantly, do you want to let folks know what's happening and when they can expect to be eating your delicious food? If I am with you. <laughs> uh, so um, we are opening an Argentinian cafe. We are transitioning from a food truck into, so into like in a small space. Uh, as you probably know, the space is gonna be turned down because they are gonna repurpose it. So it was like a move that we wanted to do and see you know, what is what. I know, you know, Winooski is growing, you know, really good. We found like a bunch of, you know, uh, good support from from the town on, in terms of like you know communication and all that. Uh, some challenges <laughs> in another, but you know, um, hopefully if everything according to plan, we are kind of like a behind a month because we found you know a few things that we didn't know. Again, we are transitioning from a food truck, so it's totally different, uh, and each town have different you know ideas and different laws too. So we are actually uh, looking to open on December fifth. We have um, the fire marshal coming on the 13th, and then the health department coming next week as well, just to check on everything they are right now doing the gas, the water, the electric, and everything. Uh, so we're really excited. We're really excited. Um, so uh, for the liquor license, we wanted to apply because we would like to have some Argentinian wines, and maybe some, you know, you know, not only have it at, at the restaurant, maybe doing some events that you know we can share. We are really looking to to let our culture, we are both from Argentina, he is the chef, <laughs> so, so and we're really looking to bring, you know, like a more like a Latin flavor, you know, mm. not only tacos around here, so, so we, we, we're really, really excited, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, restaurants always take twice as long and cost twice as much to open as you expect, right? <laughs> that's that's the that, rule. In time, I mean, really, of course, we, when we first moved there, supposedly we were going to do just cosmetic, mm -hmm. you know, That's because, sure. you know, and then all of a sudden, oh, but you need to change it, you know, to change that, which, again, it takes time, money too, of course, but it takes time, yeah. especially because we're only going to be there for like a year, a year and a half, top, mm -hmm. so we went to open right away, you know, so we can, we can have everything up, but it's, it's, it's been like a, mm -hmm. uh, and hopefully, actually, our idea was eventually move to another bigger location, in Winooski, because mm -hmm. again, it's the place to be. <laughs> yes. Well, we are very, very excited to welcome you. It's a really unique food concept, too, that's not represented here now. So awesome to see it added to the mix. Yeah. And we appreciate your interest in investment in Winooski. We hope it's the first step of what ends up being a long journey here. So that would be awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for welcoming us. Yeah. It was really, really nice experience so far. You can't wait to open our stomachs to you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, any questions, comments, concerns from uh, Liquor Control Board? Any questions, comments, concerns from the public? Great. So, seeing and hearing none, I'd entertain a motion for approval of the first class liquor license and restaurant's license for Gaucho LLC. So moved. Second. Motion by Christine, second by Hal. Any further discussion? Seeing and hearing none, those in favor, please say aye. 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 And those opposed? Motion carries. The licenses are approved. 
Uh, that completing tonight's select control board meeting, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Motion by Nicole, second by Christine. Further discussion? So you can hear none. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And those opposed, the control board is hereby adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank Good you. Good luck. We'll see you soon. I'm sorry that we, went, we need to leave, but we have some other people. It's okay. <laughs> You're busy. Because we're not only running a restaurant, we're not only a kid. So thank you very thank much. Thank you. Bye. And I hope to see you all around. <laughs> And you were an excellent guest, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good night. So having 6.07, we'll call to order the uh, regularly scheduled Winooski City Council meeting and ask that everybody again please join us for the Pledge of Allegiance led by Deputy Mayor Nicole Mace. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, first up tonight, uh, we have agenda review. This is an opportunity for members of council to make any requests for adjustments to tonight's agenda based on order, content, etc. Any questions or concerns in regards to the agenda? I think we stacked it up for guests and efficiency today. It's a big one. Okay, so seeing and hearing none, we'll move forward with the agenda as set. Next up is public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the public to address the council about anything that is not on tonight's agenda. If you're curious about what's on tonight's agenda, we do have agendas on the back in the podium. We also very, very much appreciate if folks take a moment to sign in in the back, um, if you could please. And if you didn't do it on the way in, that's okay. You can do it on your way out too. Just please remember it's helpful for us to have record of who is here and maybe spoke as well. Any items for public comment? Again, on items that are addressing things not on tonight's agenda. Once. Twice. All right. Great. So we will uh, move on to the consent agenda. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven items on tonight's consent agenda. We have the city council minutes from October the 15th payroll period from the 7th to the 20th of October and ending in the 2nd of November as well. Request for use of the center seat. Senior Center Program Budget Reserves, which was discussed in the previous meeting. Request to correct manifest errors in the grand list, which was also discussed in the previous meeting. The SHARP grant for the uh, DUI equipment and support. Uh, and the National Recreation and Park Association 10 minute walk grant, uh, which we thought in both cases were things uh, council could manage in reviewing in the uh, consent agenda versus having an open session on. And then uh, the Winooski Bridge Replacement Scoping Study Preferred Option, which was discussed and feedback uh, provided uh, to the engineers at the previous meeting. Any questions or concerns from council in regards to the consent agenda? Um, we were missing. Were you here? No, I wasn't here last meeting. Okay. Um, so we will split off the minutes and I would entertain a motion first for the approval of item A of the consent agenda, which is the city council minutes from October the 15th, 2018. So moved. Second. Motion by Nicole, second by Christine. Any further discussion? Seeing and hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. And those, aye. Op aye. those opposed? Those abstaining? Abstain. Motion carries. I would now uh, entertain a motion for the remainder of the uh, consent agenda. That's item B through G. So moved. Second. Motion by Eric, second by Christine. Any further discussion? Seeing and hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. And those opposed? Motion carries. Consent agenda is approved as presented. Thank you. Uh, next up is city update. Great. Thank you. I have a number of things. Um, <clears throat> As probably everybody knows, tomorrow is election day, uh, so voting from 7 to 7 at the Senior Center at 123 Barlow Street. Um, so far, we have sent out 580 absentee ballots about and received 525 back, which is, I think, a record for us. We processed 70 today alone, which is great. People are getting in, engaged, but if you haven't voted yet, come to the Senior Center tomorrow. Um, Members of the council probably saw that we launched the um, All Resident Voting Charter Commission homepage today. So it is up and our call for um, participants is out to the public. Um, the draft charter is up there, but obviously you haven't approved that yet, so it's marked as draft. 
Um, the intention is to bring back appointments once the counselors have been able to vet candidates. So if people are interested in serving on our charter commission to consider all resident voting, I encourage you to go to the website or come in to apply at City Hall. A um, couple of updates from the Community Services Department. We had almost 600 people come out for our Halloween event on a fairly rainy Saturday night. So thank you all to uh, those who were able to come out and especially thanks to VSAC for hosting us right downtown. As you may remember last year we moved downtown because of the haunted mill and all the things going on in the circle as well. Um, and special kudos to Ray and Alicia Finley for all of their coordination of that event. Um, Ray and his team has, have also recently launched a recreation survey to ask the public about programs they would like to see across the life cycle and across sports and arts and culture and uh, different ways for our community to connect. So it's linked off all of our social media platforms, our website, it will be posted on Front Porch Forum, hard copies will also be here at City Hall, at the Senior Center, at the library, etc. Um, it will be up for about a month, so we encourage um, people to take a few minutes and tell us what they want to see from programming um, in the future. Um, community Services is also looking for a number of volunteers um, specifically to help with Meals on Wheels and um, the ne uh, Nepali translator, um, as well as lo lots of other opportunities to get involved and volunteer. So if you're interested in that, it's winooskivt.org backslash volunteer, um, or you can contact Ray or Olivia directly. Uh, a few updates on the planning and zoning side. Um, Eric uh, Vorwald and the DRB chair, Doug, and the mayor are interviewing DRB alternate candidates. We have a vacancy in that position. Uh, so we hope to bring you back an appointee at your next regular meeting. Um, and then I also want to share that Eric um, spoke at the Northern New England chapter for the American Planning Association um, last month on our Form Ace Code and Main Street project. Um, so I think that's a great highlight of what we're doing. Um, and all accounts, he did a great job. Um, just a reminder, the Vermont Housing Conference is um, next week, November 13th and 14th in Burlington. Um, the, this year's theme is focusing on uh, municipalities who are focusing on developing affordable housing. So if anybody, any of the counselors would like to participate um, and need funding, we have uh, funding available to do that. Registration is still open. Um, and we will be presenting on um, on uh, the form on the housing projects underway in Winooski as well. Um, I had previously shared with you that the Burlington International Airport was going to release the updated noise exposure map um, in the beginning of December. That's the new map that will take into consideration the F-35 data and the contour and the revised contour lines. Um, that has been delayed um, and they at this point don't plan to release it until the end of January. Um, I think there was a data point that they were they didn't get in yet, um, so they're still working on it. So more to come on that, but we won't see anything until January 2019. Um, I want to thank you for your patience with our technology transition. You should have seen, counselors should have seen the proof point emails um, in your inboxes. So thank you for clicking through all of those to whitelist the emails you want to continue to receive. And just a reminder that we will be transitioning to Exchange next Tuesday, the 13th. Um, so they're going to flip the switch at 6.30 a.m. Gmail will be discontinued and we'll go over to Exchange. Later on this week, we'll be sending you a, a kind of tutorial uh, document about how to um, log on via your web portals. So it's pretty self-explanatory. Angela and I have been through it a couple of times. It's, it's very doable, um, but there will be a change for you all. Um, we will also have SimQuest staff here all day on Tuesday. So if you do have any troubles, feel free to call myself or Angela or Paul and we can get you connected to that staff person quickly. Um, just a re reminder, we have a special council meeting coming up on Tuesday, or Tuesday, November 27th at 7 p.m. Um, that's the special meeting to, think, to consider the um, documents related to the global settlement in the TIF district. Um, and then on December 3rd at your next regular scheduled council meeting, obviously that will be budget night. So we'll be sharing the FY20 budget with you. Um, as we've gone through the audit process for FY18, which was the first year that the TIF paid back the Winooski Community Development Corporation note, of which you serve as the Board of Trustees, our auditors have called to our attention that we have not been convening you all as that Board of Trustees. You have been taking those votes as part of our regular budget process. So the intent is there. It's the same humans voting in, their, in your respective roles and being done in a public meeting. 
um, but our attorneys are saying you really should convene as a trustee board, like you convene as a liquor commission. Um, so on October 3rd, I'm going to recommend that we convene that group and ratify the past votes you have taken um, with regard to the FY18 and FY19 budgets. Again, you've already taken those votes in public. There's documentation of that. But just to get us back on in that habit, um, we will be making that recommendation. Let's bring a second set of clothes so you can... <laughs> or hats or something. Um, and then uh, just a reminder that uh, city offices will be closed on Monday for Veterans Day and, of course, November 22nd and 23rd for the Thanksgiving holiday. That's all I got. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll go with council reports. Let's turn the left this time. Um, not a lot to report. I have been coordinating just via email with Jesse and Paul um, about communicating out updates from the commissions that we liaise to. Um, and he's put together, he drafted a really nice plan for how we can all um, align on that process. So I think we'll be seeing that soon so we can all get on the same page there. I don't have anything to report from this last meeting. Um, there's planning commission meeting. The progress continues on the uh, municipal plan, I think again, I believe Eric's uh, schedule that he laid out from last time uh, is the update there. Uh, Housing Commission meeting was very substantive um, and I think a really, really good conversation about where, um, what the goals that council relate to the planning, or excuse me, the Housing Commission uh, best fit in from a policy perspective balancing this idea of a replacement ordinance versus inclusionary zoning. Um, and my takeaway from that meeting is that um, the goals as they were set forth were more appropriately addressed in IZ and in inclusionary zoning. Um, and there's, uh, I think, a proposal to sort of ensure that that's sussed out before anything's thought through and finalizing any kind of proposals for a replacement ordinance. Um, and they heard from um, again, housing professionals that sort of supported that if your goals are that, inclusionary zoning might be the better tool to achieve what you're trying to achieve. So I think we'll be taking a deep dive on that as the policy proposals come forward, but want to make council kind of globally aware of that. Um, and then just the other thing I want to raise the flag about for, uh, and I, I've done this maybe to some of you individually, but um, you know, the Planning Commission's doing work on the municipal plan and this beautiful uh, strategic vision statement print out, thank you, um, that's behind us. Um, just to remind folks, that was done as a, an interim guiding uh, document and set of principles that were there to fill a vacuum in which, in a time where our municipal plan has clearly aged out and is not a useful document. Um, and uh, in my, meetings with the Planning Commission, I have pushed them and opened the door to say to them, that's what that was. If you guys think you need to propose some tweaks to that, um, you know, where they found conundrums in some of the language or things that they thought didn't fit together, um, that they should feel free to at least propose those ideas back as they're writing the municipal plan. So I think we're going to have that. And I don't think it's any kind of huge drastic departure by any means. But I think some of the language actually does matter that they've brought up and identified as, wait a second, is this really what, what the intent was? Um, so I think that's something that you can expect um, maybe to hear back on as we move forward with that. And I just want to also reiterate that the city put out a couple of public statements, but I know I'm getting questions about it. We remain committed to working uh, with past volunteers to map out the future um, of Halloween and the Festival of Pumpkins in particular. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the city and want to give just a huge, huge um, congratulations and, and uh, absolute gratitude uh, to, the, to the folks who for 16 years have worked tirelessly to put that on and particularly Sally Timpson who really, it's a year round endeavor to her. <laughs> uh, the amount of energy and time it puts that she and others and Seasons Greetings have put into that to make it the event that it is every year and the scale that it is um, with again nothing but volunteer help and assistance is truly remarkable and amazing and is a, a it's just such a great representation of how much people love and care about this community so a huge huge thanks for them for doing it that last time and just want to ensure as the city put out in our official statement 
we are working to ensure that that's something that's going to continue into the into the future for the community. So what it also means is I'll throw that gauntlet down. It means other people have to step up. Um, the same people can't do things forever. Um, and there's a core group of about eight to 12 people who really made that thing go. Um, and we're going to need that as the city too. It's not something where we're just going to be able to dedicate um, endless staff hours towards and for. We want to facilitate and put the framework in place, but it's ultimately going to take community participation. So if you really love fall and have a thing for pumpkins, a great opportunity lies ahead. That's all I got. I don't have anything. I attended the Community Service uh, Commission meeting October 24th, and um, there was a good conversation about uh, the need for uh, putting in place a survey to understand best what what programs should be supported and, um, and grown, so that's now in place. Um, and it was a robust conversation about scholarships and um, how, to, how to approach that. And Ray brought in some ideas from other communities to um, consider. And it sounds like they're leaning towards pooling funds and having a process to allocate them based on need. So that was that. Just, just um, hearing your update too. Just want to throw in too. Um, Hal and I both attended the Friends of the Winooski Library annual meeting as well, um, and just want to give kudos to that group and remind folks that the Friends of the Winooski Library is a non-city affiliated nonprofit entity that raises funds to do targeted investments in library programming and/or materials that are sort of outside the municipal scope or is an additional boost to the library and they are seeking additional members and additional support and event ideas. So Friends of the Winooski Library, if you Google it, they do have a website and I think a social media presence as well. So just want to put that on folks' radar. Do great work. Okay, uh, having wrapped up council reports, we'll move on to tonight's regular items on the agenda. First up, we have the discussion of acknowledgement of retirement in the police department. So I want to take a few minutes tonight uh, to recognize Pete Soons. He retired in September of this past of 2018 uh, after 20 years of service with the Winooski Police Department. Although he was a part-time employee, Pete was, during those 20 years, he was the Director of Public Safety for St. Michael's College, which during his tenure was in charge of rescue, security, and fire on campus. So he touched our community in a number of ways, not just when he was wearing a police uniform. As the person who was in charge of the schedule for my first 15 years with the police department, Pete was always very flexible about when he worked. He was just one of those employees I could count on all the time. So. I wanted to wish him the best in his next chapter, whatever that may be, and take the opportunity to say, we'll miss him both personally and professionally. That's great. <laughs> what I have here is called a shadow box in, in the police world. Uh, we like to put these together for retirees and it's basically uh, years of service coins, the, the patches that pertain to when you were here in your years of service, any medals that you uh, were awarded and your badge with your badge number. I'd like to thank retired Sergeant Ron Sheehan, he still does these for me and I'm eternally thankful for that. I'd like to present that to you. Well, thank you very much. Big moment, what do you have to say for yourself? <laughs> it's just been a privilege to work with these folks downstairs. Yeah. And I have no regrets, so it's been great. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Having bumped into you on the street, always a, always a smile, um, always a hello, always open and wonderful to interact with. I'm lucky enough not to have had keep putting my hands behind my back or something like that. So, but we can't say enough about what you um, have done day in, day out for the citizens and residents of Winooski and what that means to our community and also just the way that you've done it and the culture and the police department's been really inspiring to watch grow and I know each of you have played a huge role in that. So thanks for all of your time. Thank you. 
commitment and everything you've given the community through the years. Really appreciate you. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. Thank you. Next up, we have a uh, treasurer appointment. Um, I don't think we have Alex here tonight. Nope. Um, so uh, the city of Winooski <laughs> in June uh, <laughs> solicited applications for treasurer and, and uh, went through interview processes in July and into August as well. Um, and uh, following negotiations and conversations, uh, the panel put forward a list of finalists um, Alex Hill, or Alexander Hill, is a Winooski resident. We've provided for you today um, his resume and background, as well as uh, his letter that uh, showed his interest in the position and reasoning behind it. Uh, we found Alex to be a very engaged, uh, I'll say up and coming financial mind. So he was very excited to uh, get in, learn the ropes. Uh, but we bring uh, before you this evening, Alex Hill as the proposed uh, tr appointment for the treasurer position. Um, should his selection uh, be uh, confirmed this evening too, we would uh, get him in here in short order to meet with council and have an opportunity to converse with all of you. But he's already hit the ground running in conversations with staff too about how he can get up to speed as quickly as possible. So I think given the material that we provided to you, I don't know if anybody wants to add anything from the committee. Any questions, concerns, comments? From council. Any questions, concerns, comments from the public? Okay. So seeing and hearing none, I'd entertain a motion for approval of Alexander Hill as treasurer for the city of Winooski. So moved. Second. Motion by Nicole, second by Eric. Any further discussion? Seeing and hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And those opposed, motion carries. Excited to work with Alex. Mm -hmm. All right, next up is an annual update from our friends at Channel 17. Good evening, thank you so much for having us. I'm Lauren Glendavidian. I'm the executive director of CCTV Center for Media and Democracy. We operate Channel 17 Town Meeting Television on behalf of the Chittenden County Government Access Channel trustees. <laughs> <laughs> so there's some interlocking things there. And uh, I'll let everybody introduce themselves. Hi, my name's Dan Logan. I'm the channel coordinator at Channel 17. I'm Howard Wooden. I'm your representative from Winooski. <laughs> I'm board. Yeah. So, um, so we sent a memo in advance of the meeting. I imagine you all had a chance to read it. So I'm, we're happy to answer any specific questions that we have or that you have. Um, and then I can speak a little bit about sort of the, the current uh, financial picture for Channel 17. But the overall big picture about the, sort of the, the quality and the quantity of service that we deliver to you. I think you all have first-hand knowledge of what we do at Channel 17. I think that going live, although tonight we're not live, um, has been fairly successful for the city. And uh, when we look at, uh, when we measure that success, we're not really looking necessarily at how many people watch every meeting, but there is a range. You have, I think, a growing audience for the live programming. Um, but when there's an issue of real concern. That's where you see that many people are tuning in, not just live, but to the archival footage as well. So this go-to resource that Channel 17 has established to be holds true as it has since 1990. You know, when there's an issue of concern, we're here, and you're here as well. Um, we wanted to, so let me just pause and say, were there any questions on what we provided to you? And then I can say a little bit more about the budget request. That's helpful. Do you want to ask any questions before we go into the budget numbers? Okay, great. Um, 
So since 1990, we've been concerned about the decline in cable revenue. And uh, you know, when people say, when they ask us about this, it's been 30 years that, um, that non-cable companies have been in the space of providing video services. And we're starting to see in the Comcast realm, it, Burlington Telecom is holding steady, but you're served currently by Comcast in Winiski. Um, there's been this sort of flat revenue. And that's, um, it, and in the last quarter, for example, when you would see a lot of um, a typical increase because college students are back in town, there was a, a less than a percent decrease in their revenue. So we're just sort of seeing this slow erosion. And we know that, and we've been working to diversify our revenue in a variety of ways, as I outlined in the memo. Um, but at the beginning of uh, January, Comcast made a major adjustment due to their accounting practices, which we just um, were able to confirm was a one-time, which resulted in a, a $50,000 gap in revenue for Channel 17. And um, so this is an adjustment that's, that we could address with the help of the member municipalities if each of the member municipalities increased their contribution. And in the case of Winiski and the other smaller communities, it would be from $6,000 to $12,000 a year. And I don't need to go into the math of the value of what we provide to you because I think you understand the value of what we provide. Um, so I won't make that financial justification, but we did confirm that that was a one-time adjustment on the part. So other than the regular kind of erosion of revenue that we see that we're addressing through annual campaigns, essentially in effect, really building up our annual giving and membership base, sort of um, like Vermont Public, radio, you know, sort of in that model, that's the model we really need to move in that direction as well. Um, we're asking if you would consider in your budget process um, to increase the, the very generous contribution from six to $12,000. So let's start off too by saying we are, and I hope you get to see the messages we've filmed here. Um, and at other points in time when we've reflected on the value of what you bring to our community in terms of information, access to people to engage on issues in a way that's meaningful and that they otherwise would not have. It's astounding to me how many people come up and tell you that they've watched a meeting um, or that they regularly watch the meetings. Some people, they'll tell us that, um, you know, they do it when their baby can't sleep. Um, <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> Um, because of the drone of our voices, but in in seriousness, there 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 aren't adequate words um, to state how beneficial you are as a resource to our community and the value that you provide. So, first off, we are just immensely appreciative of all that you do. Thank you very much, and mm -hmm. and um, we know that you do a lot with a little, um, and your budget is reflective of that. So, thank you. And to Howard, we appreciate all your time as our representative on the board. I hear generally you do a really good job, um, too. So we are very appreciative of all the time, effort, energy that you put into it. Know that you bring a professional uh, lens to it as well. And we're really um, appreciative of having such a qualified person to do it. So thank you. Um, and for the um, request, it's certainly something we could take under advisement. Um, and especially as one time, it could be something we could look at reserve allocation um, potentially for. Um, so we'll have that conversation and, and uh, absolutely turn over that request um, and ensure that you receive a response from us. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. I have a question. Please. So, um, first of all, just thank you for the service that you provide. Um, and I, I, I do think the live uh, coverage is a, um, is a great addition to the, to the range of opportunities for people to engage with local government, so thank you. I was interested in the fact that in the memo, um, the revenue from Comcast, Comcast and Burlington Telecom is shared by three channels. So um, Channel 17, VCAM, and RETN. And you said later in the memo that you are looking to sort of coordinate better work, I don't know, Mm -hmm. What what the term you use? Merging some technical operations. So I'm just wondering, what where are those conversations at between those three organizations? I would imagine in a time of constrained resources, uh, as someone on the school side of things, I know there's a lot of discussion about 
consolidating functions as as pressure starts to apply be applied through changes in technology and population, et cetera. So I'm just curious yeah, about that. Absolutely. Um, we've we've discussed the question of merging our overall operations for mm -hmm. I would say about seven years. Mm -hmm. um, and what we were able to agree on was merging some of our technical operations. So we built a technical hub at their location in uh, the media factory in, on Flint Avenue. Mm -hmm. And then Burlington Telecom provided some dark fiber to us to connect from the old north end to the south end. And instead of buying our own standalone playback system, we, are, we bought into their playback system. Mm -hmm. So we're in the process of completing that transition of the playback system, but it is contingent on this technical hub that we built together, right. which is quite an accomplishment um, and it, it, it's very promising. It, it's in the same building as Internet 2, so it potentially allows us to connect to the other access centers around this, the um, state for archiving purposes. So um, we've been able to manage that. We have um, a shared bookkeeper, us, uh, Channel 17 and RATN, mm -hmm. so we're sort of taking inching little steps to back end, and I think that the three organizations are unique with their own history right. and so there's you know cultural questions you know ultimately we're all in the same business and mm -hmm. the question of merging our operations must remain on the table right and in my experience baby steps like this um, start to build that relationship and trust where you can actually start to have the bigger picture conversations if that if it goes well <laughs> if it doesn't go well then, then that needs to be a discussion so I applaud you for taking those steps yeah Thank you for pointing that out. Are there things, since we've got the public audience, are there things the individuals can do in addition to what you prescribed from the municipal standpoint in terms of our contributions and support? Do you want to add anything at this moment? Uh, donations are always very uh, <laughs> uh, And also getting involved in uh, some of our programming would be great as well. Um, to get more exposure, get more people in our studio and on our channel. Uh, we have a pretty open door policy. Um, anywhere between 9.30 and 4 o'clock any weekday, we will film the show and put it on. Um, so it's important for people to have that platform. Uh, and that would be a great way for the public to get more involved with what we do. That's great. And I think also programming ideas. So I'm not sure. Did we do anything with the Winnesky Halloween? No. So we've been busy this month. Yeah, no, we've been super busy this month. But yeah. that's a good example of a kind of unique community event that, you know, we can't go out and cover everything, but those are don't hesitate to let us and Dan in particular know that there are these programs and these things happening because we're happy to know about them and promote them. And you know, this community is so vibrant and is it's like a snowball. And there's just so much happening here. It's it's very exciting, and I just think we would like to see um, more programming that reflects the, the remarkable civic life of this city. Do do you cover school board meetings in town here? RATN. RATN does. So yeah. RATN does all the school board. RATN is the educational access operation. Got VCAM it. is the public access. Got it. And then we we are government access Got it. and you know someday if you ever want to know the unique history I'm happy to <laughs> tell you about it. Um, CCTV as kind of the mothership of public access in Vermont um, is celebrating 35 years wow. in June wow. mm -hmm. and that started right at the video cafe at Dan Higgins so Winiski was born in Winiski. <laughs> right. I do want to share my appreciation for you Lauren Glenn and your team um, you just mentioned um, the erosion of the Comcast revenues that obviously have an impact on the fees that they pay you. Um, going forward, do you see that erosion growing and is that of concern? Yeah, I think it will increase because I think people are cutting the cord, so to speak. So I, I, I don't think it will be as precipitous as this 5% gap adjustment that they made, which was resulted in $50,000, but it's just little by little. And, um, and that has an effect on staffing. I mean, think about VCAM, RATN, and Channel 17 all having a $50,000 gap. I mean, that's two people. Right. So that's very foremost in our mind, and that's why I think we have to really build our annual campaign at the same time. Um, I didn't go 
it, we didn't go into detail here, but you know, the technical needs and the technical infrastructure of Channel 17 is only getting more complex and more expensive. You would think mm -hmm. that might not be the case, but it is. There's no, you know, we use equipment as long as we possibly can. Like we really sort of just take it <laughs> to the limit and Stan knows. Uh, but it's not like there's cheaper new cameras. They're always expensive. Mm -hmm. And the, um, the infrastructure to maintain going live, et cetera, et cetera, it's just a, it's a capital intensive business mm -hmm. and it's a personnel intensive business. So it's pretty remarkable actually, as you said, that we're delivering the, the volume of content that we are for the price. And that is a huge credit to the staff and the board. It's mm -hmm. a remarkable group of people. And I think you know that as well. So thank you. Thank you. Any questions, comments, concerns from the council? We're going to be waiting for those Winiski and Ward 1 results. So you're going to take a really long time. <laughs> 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 it's so I'm not sure we'll be calling in elections very early in those two cities, but okay. Good luck tomorrow. Any questions, comments, concerns from the public? Awesome. Thank you so much for all you Thanks. do. We really appreciate you coming Thanks in. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks very for much. having us and having us early. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Next up on tonight's agenda is an MD, which is the Winooski Valley Parks District annual presentation. <coughs> so, going low tech tonight, you have pretty pictures. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There's no quiz. <laughs> Thank you. Except for us. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll do a quick intro for these folks and then um, let them jump in. But uh, Nick Warner, director, and Lauren Cody, and remind me of your programs, programs director. Both folks that we work with a ton throughout the course of the year, um, uh, as you probably see in the materials, they don't presently um, formally manage any spaces in the city, but they've been a huge resource for us as with our rec department um, coming on board a couple years ago, we've started to take a more focused look at the, the parks and trails and, and how we're maintaining those areas, in particular our sensitive natural areas like Casavan and Memorial Park. So they've been an enormous resource. Nick and I speak quite frequently throughout the year about various issues. Um, Tim, who works there, um, does all the, the trail work for them, has been a big resource, and Lauren is great on the programming front um, when we need to bounce ideas around. So really um, pretty instrumental for us as a department, and pretty excited to hear the, the report tonight, and I'm going to turn it over from there. Uh, thank you. Appreciate the time. And I'll try to keep it swift because I know it's a tight agenda. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar, uh, the Park District has been in business since 1972 as an incorporated municipality. And we have seven member towns of which Luminsky has been a member for quite a while. Um, also incorporated as a nonprofit back in 1985, so we're kind of a hybrid. We, we take advantage of both designations. Um, you have a trustee, Erin Dupuy, who's not here tonight, but I can tell you she's been very active and engaged. Uh, I think she's enjoying it, too. Um, uh, our trustees meet monthly, and they're very much hands-on. Uh, and I, you know, this presentation, this is a PowerPoint that I traditionally give. I think probably the biggest news for us this year, broadly, is we uh, just acquired a new park. We're in acquisition mode. Uh, it's a two-and-a-half-acre parcel uh, near the river mouth on the Burlington size, the former Rivers and Marina, and we just closed on that on August 28th, and we're in the process of uh, uh, finalizing the FEMA grant. We've taken out some buildings and naturalizing it. It'll be a new canoe kayak access, which will be open to the public. So we're pretty thrilled about that. Um, we also have a property in, uh, in Williston that we're taking a close look at. We've made a pitch to acquire. I'm meeting with the conservation board this week on that. Uh, there's also another property in, uh, in Burlington uh, adjacent to the homestead that we're focused on and a property in Colchester and another one in Jericho that we're going to be meeting with the conservation board out there in December. So uh, I, I heard some things from 
LG's presentation, which really relates to us, you know, incremental growth. So uh, this is, I'm going into my, I've been doing this for about four and a half years. Uh, our growth with the city has been pretty substantial in that, uh, you know, Winooski's history, financial history, and our relationship with the city. We used to manage Casabon, we used to lease it, and then we didn't lease it. And, and, uh, a lot of things have happened. I think where we're at now, I think we've described pretty well in that we really worked on building the relationship and understanding expectations and, and, and worked with Jesse and, and Alicia. Uh, we've had a very strong relationship for quite a while on the programming side with, uh, with JFK um, and uh, also have found that our ability to uh, raise revenue is really based around two needs that we've identified. One is on the programming after school side, the other is on the contracting side. So we've been doing more work. We have a contract with South Burlington. Uh, we also just did some work for Williston. We've done some work for Winooski, <coughs> both on a contracted basis and as, you know, geez, Tim, can you come over and <laughs> whack this trail basis? So uh, we felt that that was a really important thing to build up. And uh, most recently, We've had some conversations about Memorial Park, um, and uh, interestingly, and Ray's not up to speed on this, we met with uh, the folks at Redstone last week, and there is a willingness uh, to help us create a, a new canoe kayak access. Um, we had initially talked about a spot near the CCRPC building, and uh, Larry suggested, well, have you looked at the, the old carpet plant, the DR? building and they own the, the property between the river and that building. So we're going to take a look at that. I, I think it's fair to say in public domain that they've been incredibly supportive of that. So our hope is within the next calendar year that we have a site identified. Um, and you know our approach by my board is great. That we have a very generic approach to conservation which is uh, as long as there's a good outcome we conserve property that's that's a win. So we partner with most, most land trusts and land management organizations. Uh, since we're not a membership organization that competes with various land trusts and, and conservation groups, it allows us to have a very clear-cut relationship, frankly, with these groups uh, as they help bring us funding and the whole easements. For instance, a good example being with, with the former River Zan Marina, VHCB provided some money, Burlington Conservation Legacy provided some money, and the Lake Champlain Tr Land Trust is our partner, and VHCB and the uh, Lake Champlain Land Trust will co-hold an easement on the property. And then we will manage it and own it for the long term. So that's the model that we work in. And uh, we're uh, finding ourselves uh, in a really interesting spot. We own a lot of floodplain and wetlands. And given the current water quality issues, we're, we're finding ourselves front and center um, and I think my board realizes that over the next you know, decade, it really behooves us to lean into those types of acquisitions, you know, repairing floodplain uh, type properties. So I've, I've moved around a little bit. I'm not going straight through a presentation here, but I've been here before for a lot of you folks. Um, financially, you've got, the, you've got all the documents, okay? So we were able to keep our allocation flat for the last two years. Um, this year we're increasing by 6.5%, but we're asking the towns to increase by 4.8%. So we're pretty pleased about that because the difference is made up through our program and, and contracting income, which is something that we're growing over time. So our ask to you has increased by $784 uh, last year to this. And uh, that's, that's the financial side. Uh, the other towns have been, I always get this question, how about the other towns? Well, we're actually in pretty, in pretty good shape this year with everyone. Uh, we've already got at three or four towns, we've already said we're just gonna put it right in our budget. Uh, so we're feeling pretty strong going in to fiscal year 20. Uh, it's been a good year in terms of our visibility and our ability to uh, expand out our resources a bit more than we have in the past. So, how did I do so far? It's great. Any questions? Questions from council? Well, I want to say as a new newer member up here, um, yes. it's nice to have you guys come in and present. Uh, yes. This is relatively new information to me, um, so thank you for coming. 
Um, I did want to ask for, is there something you're adding to programming or adding to your workload um, that's like driving the increase or that you'd want to share with folks that will be new in the next year? Well, the things that always cost more money are personnel, insurance, utilities. And uh, we've, uh, frankly, as I look at national standards for our kind of organization, we're underfunded by about 150,000. So I actually feel like we're each year pushing up against the ceiling, but we are increasing uh, our land holdings, which you know means extra maintenance, extra time. And uh, we are increasing our, our programming, but that tends to, it's an initial investment that tends to come back in the form of revenue in the long term. Um, we've added one hourly uh, employee, Remy Kretal, who's been with us almost as long as I've worked there. He started as doing a senior project, and he was an AmeriCorps, then he was a summer camp counselor, and he was on the crew, the man does everything. <laughs> so he, actually his presence in the organization is creating opportunities for new revenue. So he's an investment that we've made. Um, so it, it's a long way of answering your question. I'm, I'm actually quite thrilled that we've been able to keep the costs as low as we have and that we're, we're constantly pushing up against that financial ceiling. Um, and the good thing about having a board that is so involved is it really keeps you Discipline in terms of how you spend money, and our you know our treasurer is very experienced, and uh, so it's just it really is the cost of doing business that has caused the raise. Thank you for that yeah. information. Yeah. Be four years in Nick. Four and a half years. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. I mean, the first time I saw you. I have a question. Yes. Um, the in the memo you cited the well, I think it's important just that there are no um, plant, uh, park facilities or parks in, within Winters Keys boundaries. Obviously, many of our residents access other parks within the, within the district, but um, I think that's often come up in the past is that we don't have parks um, that are managed through the Winters Key Valley Park District within, this, within the city, but you mentioned other um, activities that are occurring in Winters Key. Yes. You also referenced contract work, so I'm just wondering, I, th I thought that's what I heard. Yes. So I'm just wondering, were there additional, um, were, the, were those fee for service contracts? And um, so I'm, I, mean, I guess I'm trying to differentiate what is included in terms of the services for being a member of the district and paying or providing an annual contribution versus contract work. That's a great question because that's, that's the balance. Mm -hmm. So we provide technical support to all our member towns. Mm -hmm. and. I think where we kind of draw the line is, you know, if the crew has to show up and spend a day and do physical work on a site, that's where we say, okay, this is a fee-based thing if it's not within our, our parks. Um, Tim, our, our park superintendent, has 17 years of experience? At least. Yeah. <laughs> so he gets deployed to our member towns to uh, supervise crews, to help out with volunteer days, uh, and that is something we do pro bono within our organization. Um, we also like to team up with towns to, to help on, you know, thinking through part design and, and grant applications and so forth. Um, so there is a balance. You know, within, uh, we have a contract with South Burlington. They have a bond issue. So we actually have a pretty robust relationship with them on the contracting side, and we also maintain parks in South Burlington. Mm -hmm. So they're kind of the example of what the future could hold for us. Mm -hmm. um, I'll be honest with you, we're really interested in, in <laughs> Ibn Memorial Park. Mm -hmm. uh, it's preliminary to have that conversation and, and just bring it on you guys, but everything we've done is to sort of test that assumption and see if it makes sense. Mm -hmm. I think it's fair to say that mm -hmm. amongst us, and mm -hmm. we, there was a, I think, very rightly with all the issues you folks have in front of you in the swimming pool, and you know, uh, that we've sort of eased into that discussion, uh, but this, uh, I think this canoe and kayak launch could be a really interesting catalyst, because mm -hmm. if you look at the property map, uh, Redstone owns the parcel of land that's right next to Memorial. And we just heard last week from one of the principals that, yeah, you could put it right way through there, it's fine. You know, so I, I think 
there's the potential that that area could become a really exciting asset. And if it does, you know, then it would require a higher level of management. And then maybe, you know, we might be back in front of you folks saying, we'd like to test an assumption. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think as it is with that parcel, I mean, you, you probably recall we did a pretty significant cleanup down there last year. Um, and certainly on the front end and the back end of that, in terms of keeping activity, keeping trails maintained, um, Park District has been instrumental. I mean, they were really critical in helping us get through that pretty significant project and keeping things going. I mean, I think that's been a big part of it is making sure that there's positive traffic through that space to avoid some of the challenges that built up over time. And I'll say, I mean, Lauren, Lauren alone, I think, is like our number one customer down there based on social media posts. But this, it's great to have like positive traffic through there, more people using the park in, in the right way, frankly. Um, so again, I think there's an interesting groundwork laid for some future work around this. And, and the canoe launch in general, I mean, I think we've seen with the current launch being in sort of varying states of repair and disrepair based on the water coming up and down. Um, it's an asset that people really look for, you know, whenever it gets washed out, we're getting emails and phone calls about when it's going to get fixed. So I think this could be an interesting opportunity to move it to a space that's going to be a little bit more protected and um, a little bit more consistently accessible for users. So yeah, that was my question. So we did yeah. we do work on the canoe launch not too long We've, ago? And is it that now been wiped away? Or it's, what's the yeah. status? Yeah, I mean, there was literally 100 feet of shoreline that was carved away in 2011. And then there was a, 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 sort of an access path added, and we repaired the steps a couple of times, yep. and then we just realized that it, be, it was a safety hazard. Mm -hmm. And so it was pulled out several months ago. Yep. Um, that was our crew and your crew. Yep. A, we have a lot of team efforts here. Mm -hmm. yep. um, and then we've been on the hunt, which is a better location. You get closer to the dam, the, the danger from the water is a lot higher for inexperienced paddlers. Right. Yep. So we're looking downstream. We first looked at a spot that's, that's next to the CCRPC building. It probably presents some brownfields and engineering challenges. Uh, but uh, when, like I said, Redstone mm -hmm. seems to be open to talking about that other location. And uh, so we're following up on that. Um, and that would you know, involve establishing a right away and so forth. Right. And part of the other thing we'd sort of bring in is you know, we do have an attorney who works a very cheap or pro bono for us, and he gets involved and helps us provide model agreements for towns, even if they're working on projects that we're not involved with. So we try to both do what makes sense for organization and keep it fair between the member towns and at the same time provide a certain level of, of technical support. Mm -hmm. So that's a great question, because that's the balance. Mm -hmm. This isn't so much a specific really your efforts. It's just sort of a global concern that I've um, shared with our neighbors in Burlington too is everywhere else um, in this entire region, actually across the country, the board of recreational economy is huge from a buzz standpoint. And um, it feels like something in Chittenden County that we're missing from a coordinated campaign um, and effort standpoint. Um, and I, you know, Winooski is the most densely populated community in the state, and I think over 25% of our land mass is still green or um, in a natural state. So um, even here, um, we have those assets. Um, and I, I just want to express, I, I do think that there's a space for somebody, and, and it's happening in rural communities where they're struggling economically to try to reinvent themselves. Absolutely. Um, you know, places like Burke, a lot of places in Coas County, New Hampshire, invested a lot of money, time, and effort in creating um, a line to, to people who, uh, better communication about what transactional benefit, quite frankly, ex exists also for maintaining these spaces, mm -hmm. not just um, preservation and maintenance for the sake of preservation and maintenance. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think from a tax base perspective, that's some, somewhere where municipalities can always use a little additional mm -hmm. help um, in explaining our investments um, in a very coordinated, just quite frankly, financial manner to folks. Right. Um, You're speaking to conservation economics. Is, you, know, you, you can literally, if you, you own a house next to a conserved parcel that's actively conserved, it, your house is worth 4 to 20% more than if you're next to a piece of land that's not being managed or is, is you know, it, its ownership is in doubt. And uh, you can attach dollar values to every linear foot of path. You know, I get, I get that. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's a really important message. And 
what's unique about Winooski is you know the uh, Casbon Park area and Catlin Island and the SD Island parcel across which we got donated some land is actually one of the most important conservation areas on the Winooski River. Mm -hmm. It's astonishingly high value. So you guys are in possession of a very important ecological asset. Mm -hmm. It may not seem like it, but it, um, you know, that and, and the whole riverfront uh, from from the dam all the way down to the uh, to the river mouth is, is highly valued mm -hmm. and relatively stable. So doing acquisitions along those that whole corridor is something that's a real high priority for us. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess I would also point out that we're sort of uniquely positioned to take on the smaller projects. You know, if you're going to donate us 3,000 acres of land, probably doesn't make sense for our organization. But if it's 50 acres and it needs active management and has direct value to the community, that's something that we're better equipped to serve. Mm -hmm. So okay. it's a certain niche that we fill. Thank you. But you make a good point in terms of how we express our value, and that's something we do a better job with. Mm -hmm. Other questions, comments, concerns from Council? Take this opportunity to see if there's any questions, concerns, comments from the public. Thank you for your time. We appreciate it. Thanks Thank for you. all the work you. you do and the value you add to the region. And just that we always have that conversation about there's not something located, you know, physically in the city from an asset standpoint. But I want to make it clear that we do recognize what a regional, um, the regional importance and how interconnected we all are. So that's that's Thank obviously. You very very much acknowledged respected and appreciated the work that you do thank, thank you, you all thank you thank you thanks Vic. thanks for having <laughs> okay. um next up is item e. <laughs> thank you thank you very much open the front door oh and yeah, yeah, i think you turn it on <laughs> thank you I've seen it more. <laughs> it's a repeat. So next up, we have a discussion of the non-union fire competition policies and plan. So I'm going to talk slowly while Julie gets up. Um, so we have talked about this a couple of times. Obviously, this uh, doing this wage study um, compensation plan was an operational priority for us during our goal setting session. Um, this is really a key step we feel to, as we professionalize the non-union portion of our workforce, obviously, and you'll hear more of this from Julie, um, but a significant portion of our uh, workforce is unionized and then a significant portion is non-unionized. And we believe going back through the records that our, we have not done a comprehensive study of our competitiveness our competitiveness and our equity across positions on the non-union side since um, 2010 2011 so this was long overdue and a, and a real um, I think what you'll hear from Julie is a real uh, a real um, attempt towards that level of professionalization um, I'm going to stop talking because Julie um, has spearheaded this effort and done a huge amount of work with Angela's support and Chief Audie's support as well. So the credit really goes to the three of them for putting together these proposals. So Thanks, I'll try to go through this efficiently and briefly. I spoke to the staff for about half an hour and I will, I will truncate my, <laughs> <laughs> my comments for you. Um, as Jesse said, this is a, a redevelopment process that we've been working on for a couple of years. When I first started with the city of Winooski, this was the first thing that the then city manager said, we've been working on this, we don't know what to do next, take this project over. So this is sort of the culmination of that work. Um, to give you sort of a sense of who we are as a city, we have 102 positions in the city of Winooski, 56 of them are full-time. Um, in Winooski, full-time is 30 hours and above. Um, Part-time is then 29 hours and below. Um, we have 65 regular positions. Those are positions for which there is no planned um, time frame or end versus you know, a temp, seasonal, or intern position where there is a beginning and end to those positions. We also have a designation called on-call or per diem. That's our fire department is primarily on-call and um, per diem staff. 
And then we have a number of um, dispatchers and police officers who fill in gaps in our schedule that are on call and per diem. They work specifically only when they're needed to fill in a gap in the schedule. Um, we have two contract employees. We have a nice balance of leadership, supervisory, and non-supervisory staff. And the majority of our staff are actually covered under a pay plan other than the non-union wage plan. So they're covered under a collective bargaining agreement or under the fire pay plan that we'll talk about in a little bit. There are 35 staff then that are covered under the non-union wage plan and that will be important when I talk about what's currently in place. So currently we have in place a steps and grades chart. This is not the whole thing, this is just a, a portion of it that has 15 grades across 30 steps. Um, employees are placed in the steps and grades chart at the time of hire and then they increase annually. They go up a step every year at the beginning of the um, fiscal year. And the whole chart is updated by COLA annually. The steps across are about 1% between them. And the way we've placed positions in the steps and grades chart up to this point is by looking at, and you can't really see it on this, but the left column there has um, <coughs> position titles. So when we create a new position, we look at the pos position titles that we have in <coughs> the steps and grades chart and say, well, this new position looks kind of like an administrative position one, so we place it in the same um, grade and then compensate it based on that range. The personnel policy references classification, but it doesn't currently provide us any guidelines or specific definitions on how we place positions in the steps and grades chart. And new hires have been placed um, in steps for their grade based primarily on budget availability. So if there's a, a person that leaves and they're at a grade 10, when we hire the new person, we negotiate up to a grade 10. So we've been using vacancy savings um, sometimes to meet the market need. Um, so as I've worked on this for the last couple of years, I've identified some concerns that I have about the way we execute our wage plan now. For one, we have far too many grades for the population that this serves. We have 35 positions and 15 grades. And so that coupled with the way that we place the positions in the steps and grade scale, we've ended up in a scenario where we have um, some grades with a number of positions in them and some grades with no positions in them at all. So clearly we don't have the right ratio of grades to the number of positions that this plan serves. Um, not all of our non-union positions are currently compensated within the steps and grades chart that we have. There's no policy that explains why that is at this point. Um, and the placement of positions in, steps in, in the steps and grades chart we currently have is definitely open to interpretation and some um, making assumptions and biases because we don't have a, a standard criteria that we grade these positions by. There's no policy right now that, guide, uh, that um, guides us in terms of placing positions at the time of hire or at the time of promotion, and no guideline in terms of when we add a significant change to a job description, how we handle that as it relates to compens compensation. And as Jesse said, it's been 10 years or more since this, this steps and grades chart has been looked at um, and reviewed, and I don't know that it's ever been compared to the market, so we have not done that. Um, we've also had a scenario where we've treated our part-time positions and our full-time positions differently. So there was an assumption or a, a school of thought before I came to the city of Winooski that if it was a part-time position, it was valued less than a full-time position, even if the work was the same. So we have had scenarios where we had two people doing similar work at different rates of pay. Um, so as I sort of identified these concerns over the last couple of years, I set some specific goals to try and to resolve those, one of course is to look at state and local comparative data, um, to develop a system by which we place positions using a common tool and standard definitions um, consistently in our pay scale. We want to consider internal equity and then evaluate positions in such a way that compensation is equitable and without bias to the extent that we can do that and then support our recruitment and retention efforts. We've spent a lot of time over the last couple of years um, trying to professionalize our um, recruitment process. So we've brought in really good people and now we want them to stay. <laughs> um, so, you know, as I considered those goals, I reviewed alternate plans. I had a lot of conversations with my colleagues, um, both in the private sector and in the public sector. We gathered wage data from the Vermont League of Cities and Towns and the Bureau of Labor and Statistics. And then I began to develop um, policies based on the best practices 
And my goal was to develop, to develop policies that clearly define how we address wages throughout the employment cycle from beginning to end through promotions and right through someone's retirement if they stay here that long. Um, and then, of course, to really define how we place the positions in the steps and grades chart so that's done consistently. So then um, I went out to my co-workers and asked them to participate in this project by going through a citywide job description update. So we updated the format of our job descriptions, we created common standards that tie the job descriptions back to the strategic vision plan, include diversity and equity um, language, include teamwork and customer service language, so that that's included in all of the job descriptions at every level across the, across the city. We also created um, uh, equity language as it relates to minimum skills and um, education in each job description. So if a position requires a bachelor's degree, we added language that said bachelor's degree or equivalent combination of years of experience. So to intentionally to open the door to folks who may not have a um, formal degree but have the same skills that they've obtained in other ways. Um, and then while we were working on the job description review, Angela very diligently updated our steps and grades chart, and we'll talk about that a little more in a second. So um, just to kind of run down all of the important parts of the plan that's, that's proposed before you, first we define classified versus non-classified positions. So classified essentially just means classified into the non-union wage plan. So it was a way of defining which positions were in this plan versus which positions are covered by some other plan within the city. And we've included that in the job description. So if I win the lottery tomorrow and go away, the next HR manager can pick up this information and know how this particular position is compensated. Um, this plan also directs the process for placement of positions in the pay scale. So we developed 10 weighted categories. Each of those categories has between three and five levels, and each level has a point associated with it, a point value associated with it. So to grade the positions, we look at the job description and the content of the job description, assign those point values, and at the end, we have a total points, and that total points equals a step, or a grade, excuse me, in the um, step and grades chart. Um, and we've truncated the step and grades chart to be more appropriate for our size. So we've um, narrowed it down to eight grades across 15 steps. With the, um, so the previous, um, steps and grade chart had 30 steps. We have the same increase in the 15 step grade chart, but we've front loaded it with the assumption that the years that you are, uh, your earlier years in the city of Winooski are the years in which you're learning the most. So we're rewarding the years in which there is a steepest, the steepest learning curve. Um, this plan also addresses um, how we'll use compensation as part of recruitment by setting some structure around where we place new hires in the pay plan and setting limits on that. Um, it continues to recommend annual step increases and has parameters for how we'll evaluate positions when job duties change and how we'll handle compensation when someone is promoted to a new grade or voluntarily demotes to another grade. So we've outlined all of that. The idea here is to level the playing field as it relates to salary conversations to remove as much bias as possible so that the compensation is based on the work that's done and the skills required to do that work. Um, so once we had the job descriptions updated and the tool built and the plan um, built out, Angela and I went through and updated or graded all of the positions in the city of Winooski, well, that are in this plan anyway, with the exception of our own. We did not grade our own positions. Um, and as we did that, we constantly um, went through a checks and balances process. So every position that we graded, we went back and looked at the previous positions that we graded to make sure we were treating them similarly, if they had similar um, qualifications or budget responsibility or what have you. And then we checked um, where they landed in the current wage plan against what we knew to be the market for that um, position to make sure that all of those things lined up. Once that was complete, we took it to Jesse and we did a citywide, looked at every single position and did an internal equity review. Um, then we compared where those positions landed to where the current staff salaries were and found that 16 of our positions were below the pay range that was developed in the new plan. 
Um, five of them are 6% or more below the new range. Five are 5% or less. And there are six positions that are 5% um, or, or less below the new range, but we're added, making additional changes to them, and those are our thrive positions. So we've treated those as seasonal positions so that folks have reapplied every year for their position. You know, in the, they reapply in the fall for the school year, they reapply in the spring for the summer. Um, and we've had some good retention with that staff, and we, we don't want to ask them to continue to reapply for the same job. So we're looking at those as regular positions rather than temps and seasonals. There are 14 positions that are within the range and five that fell above the range. So from there, we looked at the um, contingency line on the salary contingency line and made a plan um, to propose to you on how we would address um, adjusting these salaries. So employees whose current salaries are 6% or more below the new pay range, our recommendation is to adjust them at least 50% towards the minimum for FY19 and then place them in step one of their new range for FY20. Employees whose salaries are below the new pay range by 5% or less, um, we're not recommending a change for them for FY19, but <coughs> recommending placing them in step one for FY20. And then for employees who are within their range, um, we've figured out where they would fall on the pay scale and they would just continue to move up a step each year. Those that are at the top would receive a COLA increase um, only after they reach step 15. And there's no plan to, um, to reduce salaries as part of this process. So that's the non-union wage plan. And then um, John and Angela and I did quite a bit of work related to the part-time and per diem firefighters. Actually, the, the creativity around this plan all came from the chief. Do we, do we want to pause here? Sure. Do you want to ask questions about the non-union plan before we move on to the firefighters plan? Doing it all at once. Anybody want to pause for questions mm -hmm. yet? Good evening. Good evening. We've got Battalion Chief Spittle with me on a little support. Something goes wrong when you You didn't plan to have a fire call right now. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Yeah, we didn't. So, um, Kind of by not knowing, um, I was working on internally with the officers and the membership um, at the same time, um, trying to figure figure out a uh, compensation plan um, for our part-time firefighters and per diem folks, um, and it happened to kind of cross with what the city, and what Julie was doing, so it made sense to kind of roll it all together. Um, obviously, her involvement with Angela. Um, was pretty instrumental in doing this. The old wage plan for the fire department was at times um, non-existent. Um, kind of initially was done on a stipend per call type um, scenario. Um, Angela worked with um, Chief Bergeron to um, create a five-year plan that assured uh, minimum wage and they put in years for service. So it was zero to five, five to 10, 10 to 15. And that was the end of the plan. Um, this is the last year of that plan, so this is kind of all lining up. Um, when folks come into the fire service, particularly here in Winooski, um, you know, there's a set of standards in which, training standards in which we have to assure people have, um, that essentially we require them to go get. Um, for us, it's 80 hours um, of, we call it the county class, it's a basic class. Um, we don't require the state mandated, or the state not mandated, the state recommended Firefighter 1. We're not a full-time department, so we don't have to have Firefighter 1, although we highly encourage it. So we looked at our current budget, what's allotted for part-time salaries, and um, it's a reward system, so we assure that there's minimum wage, and then as people progress through and get training, they get the county class, they get a little more an hour. Um, they get the hazmat, they get a little more an hour. Um, they start to drive our equipment, they get a little more an hour. Um, it goes out to where um, I feel, we feel, um, makes the most sense for Winooski to, to place its, its um, money um, and reward these folks. And that's up through fire instructor, firefighter one and two. Um, people can go on and on and on through their, you know, to get training and certifications. We certainly want to encourage that, but there are limits to our budget, we can't, 
you know, for me to send someone to firefighter one and pay them as a part-time employee is about 3,800 bucks. Um, so if we have four or five of those a year, um, that's pretty significant. So this is a step in the in a significant, significantly different direction of we will reward them. It's their own time. We will support them in doing that, and on the backside, we can give them more an hour because they're bringing some value back to the back to the city. And if I can interject for a second, Chief. So this is very similar of if for those of you who are here when we ratified the Ask Me contract of how we looked at. Um, buying a better product for the taxpayer dollar. So if you remember in the AFSCME contract, we said if you get your CDL, you can go up to an EO2. So in theory, we could have all EO2s and no EO1s with the thought that the more qualified staff we have, the better able we are to deploy our resources in a variety of more efficient ways. Same principle here. You know, the chief is talking about rewarding staff. It's also a way to build up skill sets across staff. So when there's a call and there's only two or three people responding, those two or three people are as trained in a variety of things as possible, and therefore the residents are getting the best service. Um, Great summary. <laughs> it's kind of in a nutshell what, we, what we've done. Um, we've spoken, obviously, with the membership about it. Um, um, some other pieces defined in here, and that's our, um, you know, we, we now have a pretty um, specified training program. The state requires 24 hours of research hours. Um, we will provide 72 hours um, through our plan, and that's, that will be done on three Wednesdays. Um, you know, history is we, people would arrive on a Wednesday and, um, and then be told what the training is, or in some cases the training would be put together at that time. So we front-loaded it and created modules for the training um, so that if you're, on, if you're a member for this Wednesday, we can send it to you on Google Group. You'll understand what, what's expected that night. Um, just try to front-load and become more efficient and effective of how we're delivering the training. So our model, through this incentivized plan, will we'll support people with 72 hours of training. Um, and we'll pay people to go to the county class because we require it, the 80, 80 hours. Um, and then they can progress if they have other aspirations to go get some, some further training. Or if we, in the future, want to move to the Firefighter One mod, you know, modules, um, we can expand the program. And this addresses your coverage concerns for the station because we've developed two types of firefighters for the part-time. So there's two classifications of firefighters in this plan. There's part-time firefighters, which is any interested community member or someone in the area who wants to, to come and join the team and will be provided the training that the chief talked about. And then to cover more station hours, there's per diem firefighters who are active with other agencies, get permission to come to work for the city of Wernerski during their off hours, because generally they work 24 on, 48 off, so they can spend some of that 48 off with us. And we're seeing some huge benefits of that. We know from four in the afternoon till our part-time staff get back from their jobs, you know, six six to seven at night. Um, there's a huge hole for us, um, and that's one of our higher call volume times. Um, so we've intentionally got them here Saturday, Sundays to help alleviate some of the part-time stress, and then also four to eight um, during the weekdays. Um, and we're seeing some benefits to that. Um, so the um, proposal to implement this would be along with the change in minimum wage for January 1st um, because it continues to be based on minimum wage. So minimum wage is always the base rate for these add-on amounts for certifications. So really the request for you tonight uh, per the personnel plan and the charter as outlined um, your action, if you so choose, is to adopt the two different policies um, in one step and then also approve the updated job description, um, uh, purposes, funding sources, and classification, um, which is, again, as outlined in the personnel plan. And we're happy to answer. It's a lot of information, so happy to answer <laughs> any questions. Let's open it up. Some of us have been chewing on this longer than others have seen it. So, first of all, I just want to commend you guys for um, a 
really tremendously professional process that was clearly undergone here that was very thoughtful and thorough and at a, a level of sophistication that um, with no malice towards, you know, past um, times in the city, um, you know, we certainly were not capable of um, without you individuals in place and the support of Angela. Thank you so much and all the um, directors and staff from, from everyone up and down. So just want to say thank you very, very, very much for that process. And I think that regardless of what conversations unfold or the reflections of people, I think we all recognize that the city's greatest asset um, is the humans that come in and out of these buildings every day and provide the services and the work for the people. Um, that you, we can fund stuff, right? We can put money into bins to be used, but um, it means nothing if it's not being executed well and done in a professional manner. And we're incredibly appreciative of that work every day and that there's been broad recognition as a city that this is something that's been overdue. So thank you for putting together a really great product that was easy to follow from a process standpoint and um, with clear reasoning and rationing for conclusions that you came to. Julia, I have, I'll, I guess I'll just kick off questions. I, I'm curious as to, um, a lot of step programs that I'm more accustomed to seeing have steps for a couple of years to acknowledge um, need for retention of folks early in their career and also for the quick advancement that they're likely making in terms of their contributions to the organization. And then tend to have multi-year holds on those steps to then start to encourage longevity. And the reason it's weighted that way, my understanding has always been, is to then value the fact that the retention of you is part of, we've invested in getting you capable of doing the job, right? And then after that, it's to reward longevity because that's the next piece. Because just from a cold, hard number perspective, the biggest expense now is not necessarily you doing the job a little bit better or worse, but actually having to replace you as an individual. Sorry to talk about people that way, but that's part of the deal, right? So what's the what's the thinking between one year, one step? I'm, I'm interested in that. So um, kind of going along with what you're saying, we front-loaded the steps and grades chart so the increases mm -hmm. are larger in the beginning and then they taper off for that same reason. Mm -hmm. The reason for one year, one step is to make sure that we maintain that market value so that we're within the market range for those positions and don't fall out of that before we do our next market review. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wrote it, I've written into this plan that we would do that every three to five years. But you know that could be someone else's responsibility. It may be something that happens, it may not be. So at least this plan is built to um, be sustainable and continue whether or not the city goes out and does that market review in a couple of years. Uh, I have a similar question maybe. Um, how might these new policies impact employee retention? So employee retention is the number one reason for putting these policies into place. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have um, a pretty high turnover rate for a public organization. Um, I think our 2017 um, turnover was somewhere in the neighborhood of 20% and we're trending upwards of that for 2018. Mm -hmm. um, so by having something clear, consistent that the employees have access to, that they can look at, they can look at their jobs, they can look at where they're going in the organization, um, and to some degree, they can also look at the steps and grades chart and then the other job descriptions that you know, may help them plot out where they're going to go next within the city. All of that helps with retention. All of that helps reduce the, the turnover that we're experiencing. Turnover is my primary concern because it's mm -hmm. expensive. It takes between 30 and 45 days to refill a position. And the HR metrics that, that gets thrown around is that it's 30 to 50 percent of the salary to the, is the cost of replacing someone. So if you look at our salary costs and having, you know, 20% of our, our per employee population turnover, it is a concern. Thank you. I have a question about the cost impact chart. I just want to make sure I'm reading it the right way. So, um, F, in particular, FY20, 
cost with no plan imp implementation versus with plan implementation. And in the memo, there's a few different numbers. That I'm just so I'm just confused. So, are those? Is it seventy-one thousand six hundred sixty-seven dollars on top of the seventy-nine seven forty-eight? Yes. Okay. So we're adding as we. Correct. That's Correct. a confu That's a confusing way, I think, to to display that. Or um, so. And then it says in the memo. With full plan implementation, FY20, the general fund additional impact would be 50167 So, So I'm just not clear how those numbers. Sure. So um, the cost across all funds is across all funds. So many of our salaries are split between the general fund, the water fund, the wastewater fund, the CDC um, fund, the parking fund. Um, so, the, so the budgeted numbers in the chart are across all funds. And the 50167 is the general fund impact. That's the tax rate impact. Okay. And so, but the FY20, I just want to be clear that the FY20 cost with plan implementation is almost double what it would be with no plan implementation. Correct. So I'm reading that right. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So it's 140. Right. 150. 150 across all funds <laughs> and that's the really driven by the implementation decision to to not we were trying to stay within budget for what we knew we had for this year mm -hmm. um, and adjust mm -hmm. people who are below that six percent percent are below the range and not touch the people who are zero to six to five percent below the range so once you actually start adjusting everyone to be equitable at step one of their grade, that there becomes a bigger impact. I think it's important to note for tonight's discussion, what we're asking you to adopt is the, the uh, policy and the framework, you know, how we're valuing positions, how the positions are talked about, what grades they're put in, et cetera. It is still our obligation to bring you back an FY20 budget that meets your financial goals. So while this is currently our intention and certainly what we have talked to staff about, um, it is still ultimately the leaders, my responsibility and the leadership team's responsibility to bring you back a budget that's according to your previous goals. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that plan could change pending other budget decisions. I.e., we're not asking you to vote on that dollar amount tonight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> She's setting the wheels in motion. I think that's an important to acknowledge with the goal of this works with that level of investment and makes sense with that level of investment. So it's agreed, but I think if you're taking one step, we should be yep. prepared to take the next. Right, which is why we laid yeah. out the full impact. Right. So I have a, I have a couple of questions. Um, but first I want to say, like, reading through this, it's very impressive to see all of this put together at once, um, that the goals slide that you shared about, you know, taking out bias, having pay equity for staff is really important. I think also having something for staff to reference to understand their, their role and their expectations um, is really helpful. When you were talking about the job descriptions, um, and like how you figured out what grade folks should go into. Is, is there like a sort of a standard profile or rubric type like to your, your illustration about should, if you won a lottery and you weren't here tomorrow, <laughs> um, you know, and you had a, someone's role change or a new role open up, like how would that be evaluated against this? So if you look in the packet that you have, there's an evaluation tool and that's Standard, I think I'm answering the, your question. That's this, the, the standards that we use to evaluate all of the job I see. So those are including like the types of tasks that folks would do? Correct. Okay. So if, if I went away tomorrow, the next person could pick that up and use that to, to grade another position within the city. Okay. Um, I had some questions about the front-loaded learning curve situation, but I think those have been addressed too. Um, I had a question about the for the part-time staff for, for fire department. Um, you know, as you had said, there's like multiple like incremental increases that one can get for skill building. 
And I just wondered if you all had been able to take the chance to like see how that plays out and like if somebody like went all out and really built themselves up, would that still be feasible within like what you typically budget for? The answer is yes. Um, so historically FD has had a part-time budget and a number um, and this is, has peeled that apart and um, you know there's instances where we've taken assigned you know, admin time and, and been very pointed about where we're putting that and this is just another step in that. Um, we are able to do um, this within this year's budget, um, July or January 1st to, to June 30, just by um, adjusting. And, and um, you know, FD historically has had a, a large surplus at the end of the year, um, to the tune of sometimes 40 grand. Um, so this is part of our desire not to be asking for money that we don't need. Um, and it's an investment, for me, it's an investment in our people and our, our model that we're providing the services with. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's great to hear. Thank you. How do you measure if this is successful or not? Our retention, our, you know, our turnover would go down. And money isn't the only thing that keeps employees at a job, but it certainly is among the top two or three. That um, and, and I do know. I guess it's anecdotally that of the you know staff that I've interviewed when they left, they not all, but a number of them left for positions that paid more um, in another city or another organization, doing similar work but that paid more. Are the metrics I, changing on the value of retention because people are changing jobs more quickly? I don't know that people are changing jobs more quickly. Well, I suppose they are because our unemployment rate is low. I mean, there's, I think the September number was 2.9% and I think I read that there are something like 7,000 open positions. So we're competing with hundreds of other organizations for the same qualified candidate pool. So possibly. I also think another measure of success uh, for both pay plans, non-union and the fire pay plan is um, how how our employees move throughout the system. So one of the things Julie was very careful in building out in the system was grades that overlap and the evaluation chart with the job descriptions that show employees how they can advance in their career within the organization. So I think a measure will be how many of our employees move up in grades or up in positions over time as opposed to coming here getting really good experience and going to another city for that next professional move if they can see a path here that they would stay and keep that local expertise here um, i think we have some great examples of that on our team already um, we also have some examples of that not on our team where we haven't been able to retain somebody here and give them that next growth opportunity similarly in the fire department how you can um, come in as a community member who wants to serve and wants to give back gain skills and grow in kind of in, a, in leadership positions within the fire department because you have more skills and are able to operate different apparatus do different technical skills do different trainings etc so I think it's both that retention, but also promotion within the organization. I think it would be helpful for us, especially if this is something that's proposed to be on a three to five year schedule and regular schedule, which it should be, should be a standardized thing, is to really think about how we measure its impact and its success. Um, and I think because of changing workforce demographics and the fact that people just don't have an interest in staying in jobs as long. Um, I think it's gonna be more than just retention. Um, maybe it's you know consistent exit interview data that indicate what role wages played. I think for us having, you guys are responsible for making these kinds of professional recommendations about what it looks like from a, right, we're, we're expert, we're ex we are expecting you to be the professional management team that's looking and thinking about that. I think from a cost benefit analysis for us and putting potential dollars forward um, from the taxpayers, that having that uh, 
something in in on the back end of this that's going to very carefully consider uh, what its impact would be would be very helpful. Um, not obviously as much for this. You've created the justification for the system, and it's way overdue from a timing perspective. But I think that's going to be really important as a next step. Again, I think the exit interview is a key one there. Maybe it's an employee satisfaction survey, too, about what people, I mean, if you go into the best business, right, by the Vermont Business Magazine, the wage survey is a huge portion of how they grade those is how people feel that they're compensated in relation to their professional peers. Um, None of us get paid enough, right? So, so I will say, and talking, speaking a little bit out of school here, we are not competitive with our surrounding communities. I mean, even with this proposal, our our ranges are below the average for cities in Shandon County. Um, so I worry a little about that because I think, you know, I'll use me so as not to put other other staff. If I were to compare my salary to city manager salaries, it's it, it that's not where I'm going to get my professional satisfaction. I'm going to get my professional satisfaction by being part of a team that's doing innovative things and is thoughtful and is connected and working for an interesting community. I'm not sure we're ever going to win on the employee satisfaction question based on compensation. Yeah. Which is appropriate. I mean, I think given our demographics in this community, I mean, I was actually going to ask a question about the wage data comparison but I mean it's the same is true for the school district employees mm -hmm. and that uh, at least on the school district side the funding is shared more broadly across the state we don't have that luxury on the city side we really have to draw from our tax base within um, the city boundaries and we have to I think our compensation plans need to reflect the ability of our residents to support. Um, and I do think that the job satisfaction um, does come from more than just compensation. Mm -hmm. I think to me the biggest um, benefit in, uh, to this is being fair, clear, equitable, um, and eliminating the risk of bias. Um, um, it's just an absolute necessity that we address those concerns and I appreciate the work that went into doing it and I just want to like I have on some of our other conversations caution us against looking to South Burlington or Williston or Shelburne as sort of the marketplace I mean I know we're in Chittenden County and so that's a factor but I also think um, that's not our economic reality in this town city and that's that context is appreciated and I don't disagree with what you said it doesn't mean we don't have to explain it to people and doesn't mean that we don't have to tie a transactional value of an expenditure to the taxpayer from an expectation standpoint if I weren't sitting in government I would demand the same thing from them and telling me what benefit transaction am I getting from that saying that we've made something that's not good a little bit better and we feel better about ourselves for that's not an excuse and not not a reason why most people i think are going to accept that so i do think we've got to balance those two conversations and discussions and then the secondary piece i just want to bring up and this is kind of large philosophical stuff for us but i just we i don't think we can take an action like this where you're moving the baseline natural appreciation of expenses for the city on an annual basis this is not just impact one year it's it moves the needle for then what the cola impacts going to be year over year um, is that this body needs to understand every time we make decisions like this that there's a long-term financial impact to that and that that has to steer and guide decisions that we make in other areas about the way our our tax base is being managed um, it's nice to to do what's right and do the right things we have to in my opinion back that up um, with responsible sound fiscal decisions that then support the growth in expenses that we're creating by doing something like this, which is absolutely the right thing to do. Um, but I just, I can't let something like this go without throwing that back into our laps, that we have a fiduciary responsibility for people not to just do what's good for the humans that work here who do a great and wonderful job every day and year, but also to 
be sure that we're committed to, to uh, pushing forward strategies that make this financially sustainable long term. So box. I agree with that a little bit. I do kind of have a little some points of disagreement and one that it's I think it's not just about doing the right thing, but I think we heard there's an economic incentive for this if 20% of our positions go through turnover on an annual basis and we're spending 30% of that position on managing that turnover. This is a smart investment for the taxpayer. It's, um, it's fiscally responsible, but I also do think we should pay people what they are worth. Um, and I do, and I do, I am interested in comparing ourselves to the surrounding communities because people's cost of living is just as high here, despite potentially getting paid wages that are less than their colleagues in similar positions around the state or around the region. I do agree there are a lot of financial pressure points in general, fiscally and when you ski right now, but I think this is smart economics. And also that's, from a values perspective, how we're treating our people, I think it's important. Other questions, comments, concerns? Um, do, the next question for the body is, number one, is there any benefit from a budgetary development standpoint, et cetera, to approving this now versus at a later meeting date? I just wanna, I just wanna put that out there. So at the next meeting, we will be presenting a budget to you. Right. So in the absence of a vote on this, we will be making some assumptions um, because we will have to build a budget based on some salaries. So we should at least... Um, so if there are big, if you are thinking about big changes... Float our proverbial tea leaves. <laughs> it would be nice to know that. Okay. Um, so th this is a lot of information. It's a discussion that some of you have never engaged in before. Um, and for most of us, we've just kind of said, hey, globally, we know this is an issue that's upcoming and needs to be done for the last several years we've had this conversation. Um, so um, I turn back to the council, as somebody who has spent some more time and has a different degree of comfort with this, to say, do you have additional questions you think may surface as a result of spending some more time with this material since you've had it since Friday for some of you? Um, or are there... Um, I'll end up asking for a motion whether there's comfort moving forward with the proposal as is. Um, and you know, the secondary piece is the financial discussions do come later when it comes to dollars and cents, but this would at least enact the framework and allow a budget to be constructed based off of this. Anybody want to voice any reservations about taking it on tonight as a voting item? Are there other questions, comments, concerns for Julia or Jesse? I guess I wonder um, how might this policy incentivize um, growing a, a diverse workforce? Certainly by having competitive salaries. I mm -hmm. mean, we um, it gives us some leverage in uh, attracting talent from other places mm. to Winooski. Um, and by other places, I mean outside the borders of Vermont, potentially. Um, I think also the language that we've changed in our job description to have equivalents uh, is probably more important in terms of growing a diverse population within our uh, workforce. Okay. Other questions, comments, concerns for Julia, Jesse, or Chiefs? The whole leadership team really did participate in this process, so if there are questions for any of them as well, many of them are here. You know, we only get brief opportunities to express our appreciation for what each and every one of you do every day, but please do know we're talking about dollars and cents here, but you are a massively appreciated group of humans that does tremendous, tremendous work, and thank you for all that you do. Um, staff in the room, thank you. Any questions, comments, concerns from the public? 
So seeing and hearing none, I entertain a motion for approval of the non-union fire compensation policies and plan. Second. Motion by Eric, second by Hal. Any further discussion? Seeing and hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 <laughs> no suppose. <laughs> motion carries. Thank you for your work. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, actually, don't leave. Pete, oh, yeah. hey, John, can you uh, just slide all the right, front? Next up, we have fraternal order of the police contract. Um, and uh, Chief Hebert is here as well to discuss this. So we have um, our negotiation team, uh, myself, Angela, Julie, and the chief, uh, have been engaged in negotiations for a successive bar collective bargaining agreement with our fraternal order of police, our union that represents police and dispatchers um, since March. Uh, their contract expired at the end of June. Um, and we have reached a uh, agreed to contract that is presented here before you. Um, the union ratified it on uh, Friday morning. Um, so it is done on their end. Um, and if you, I'm happy to walk through the significant concerns here, but if there are, um, if there's a question about whether you would approve it, I would, I would suggest that that be done in executive session first. Um, just because if we need to go back to the table, um, that could uh, disadvantage us. Can I recommend that we just high point the major changes sure. in the contract if you were just a layman read side by each? Yep. Um, so I, I did send a confidential memo to you all with some highlights, but just to for the public just to um, and for you all to draw your attention to some particular places. Um, so as you know, and we're gonna talk about later in the agenda, we are working on a, the community voted to move towards a regional dispatch model. So we included a um, provision, we agreed to a, a severance provision for dispatchers if the city discontinues providing that service, um, a severance opportunity that would be provided to those dispatchers who are laid off. The uh, condition there is that they are employed on the last day of the layoff. Um, so this ensures the city um, some succession planning. So if that transfer is to happen, we are able to maintain our service delivery until that last day. And um, then the new organization picks up from there. Um, we move to a model where holidays uh, uh, are paid as they occur. Um, in the previous contract, people were allowed to um, carry forward their holidays, so it was creating quite an overtime and scheduling challenge for us administratively. Um, with this new model, the holiday is um, compensated on the day it happens and uh, releases us from that scheduling challenge. Um, we had a real view of equity going into this contract, a goal of um, treating our police officers and dispatchers the same as we treat all others. Um, they, in their previous contract, had a health insurance cap. Um, they, they were, if the cost of their health insurance went above a percentage of their salary, they were capped out. So they were actually paying less for health insurance than the rest of our employees. Um, so we're um, incrementally stepping up that cap to, for parity across the organization. Um, we discontinued the practice of the city paying for the union dues. Um, it was um, something that was entered into the contract in the last negotiation session, although we con continued our commitment to paying the civil liability insurance, which had been the city's intent from the beginning. So we're achieving that by paying a lump sum towards that uh, criminal liability insurance, uh, but discontinuing the practice of paying um, the dues. And then it's a three-year contract. Um, we created a safety committee and a labor management committee, which are best practices that many, that Julie and I have always had before in our CBAs that um, we've stood up with our AFSCME contract and now um, FOP will continue in the same direction. Um, and then finally, we put into place a um, COLA range for wage increases as opposed to just additional increases on top of COLA um, to again look at parity across the um, employee groups. Anything significant I missed? And this is um, with this, con if this contract is approved, um, all of these changes um, we can do within the FY19 budget. There's no additional funds needed. That was the next question. 
Okay. Um, are there other public questions or concerns from council for uh, Jesse, Julia, or Chief Hebert? In a moment, I'll entertain a motion. If a councilor holds a question um, in regards to uh, specific negotiation conversations or something uh, in regards to whether or not you may want to uh, agree with this contract or not around specific provisions, that is something that is covered by um, open meeting law as a potential executive session item. So um, if you've got something like that lingering in your mind, when we open up for motions, you could also make a motion to enter into executive session, if that's something that you help. Are there any public questions for Jesse, Julia, or Chief Huber at this time? I wanna say thank you all for your work in negotiations. I know they're difficult, and I know you just got up from the table like nine, ten months <laughs> ago, so. so. We're the, good for a while here. Yeah, yeah the air had barely refreshed in the room. So thank you very much. I appreciate all the time and work. This is one of these unsung things that people don't understand what a big deal it is and how much time and energy it takes in the course of doing stuff like Main Street and swimming pools. So that this is this is really a, a big thing. So thank you. Questions, concerns from the public? Okay. Um, so with that, I would entertain a motion in regards to the proposed approval of the return order of the police contract. Move that we approve the return order of the police contract. Second. Motion approved by Nicole, second by Eric. Any further discussion? Seeing and hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And those opposed? Motion carries. Thank this you. was a successful visit, Julie. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank yeah. you, Chief. Uh, oh, sure. Uh, next up on the same vein uh, is uh, Chittenden County Public Safety Authority update and fund balance allocation request. Um, so the Chief is going to stay up here with me for a moment. Um, to get my papers organized here. Um, so we've been on town meeting day. Uh, the voters approved us um, continuing to explore looking at a regional dispatch model. Um, the board of directors was stood up, comprised of the town and city managers and their designees from uh, the six communities who moved forward. Um, we have issued in the last, since we started meeting in April, we have issued a RFP for technical assistance, which is really the uh, consultant who will finalize the development of the Chittenden County Public Safety Authority, um, look at technology, look at standard operating procedures, look at staffing, look at location, um, really all of those technical details that are required before we actually flip a switch to say this new organization would consider taking a 911 call. Um, so the RFP was issued in June. There was a review committee. Chief Hebert sat on that review committee on behalf of Winooski. Uh, dispatchers were also invited to participate and provide feedback, which was great. And we got a lot of um, incredibly useful feedback from them through the process. Um, and at the last board meeting, uh, the board of directors voted to approve the, um, to award the contract to an organization called IXP Consulting, which is a consulting firm who runs regional dispatch centers across the country and has done this kind of integration before. Uh, the total value of the contract for FY19 is $100,000. The Winooski portion of that is the $6,926. Um, according to our uh, population size. It's a population formula. Um, so as this is, an, we did anticipate that this was an unfunded one-time cost, so we're asking for fund balance to do this. As a significant caveat to that, I will say that this is the first step of that, those startup dollars that we will need over time, um, and we will need to think critically as we go into FY20 of, is that, is that those additional startup dollars, we need to continue this work into FY20, dollars that we build into an operational budget or dollars that we use one-time funds to pay for. Um, just as a reminder to the council and for those who are new to this conversation, the, while the fi funding model has not been approved by you yet, and that is the final 
the vote you would need to take to move to regional dispatch. Um, the concept is that the communities that choose to move for the first two years of operations will trans transfer the money they are currently spending on dispatch services to the new entity to fund that. And then in year three, that funding formula will be adjusted um, based on calls for service. Um, so there's a question about is this a one time, are these startup costs a one time expense or an operational expense? Um, that's something the board is still considering, um, but I just wanted to flag that um, this $6,900 is not the only request we will see for these startup costs. It'd be good as much as we could to try to preview those. I, think I mean, I, I know it's, that's probably hard, sorry, but yeah. So the challenge we are, the board is facing here is um, I, that's really IXP, assuming we get the funding from all the communities, that this kind of request is going to all the communities this month. Um, so we will not give the consultant a notice to proceed until that funding is put together. Um, but the work IXP will do is really the work to develop that budget, and we won't know that until the FY20 budgets are finalized. Okay. So there is some projections, and we certainly have those, mm -hmm. but they're going to be projections until IXP is up and running. Okay. <clears throat> so I have some questions about the, and I get this at this point, contracts and awarded. So well, the contracts is a little set in stone. I remember people bid for a specific scope of service or? Um, so yes, they responded to an RFP that had the scope of service that's, that's attached here. Right. So um, the contract has not, so the board has voted to award it to IXP, but will not issue a notice to proceed unless we can get the money raised from the communities. So I misspoke. I meant that the scope of service is pretty much yes. set in stone, but I just want to flag some areas of um, wonder, I guess, uh, and not necessarily concern at this point, but um, there's a lot of references to services that would m be consolidated versus services that would stay local. Um, and I don't, I mean, to, in my mind, a reason to do this, there were two reasons, one to improve the quality of service and response time, but also to potentially become more efficient um, in operations and not duplicate um, services and so I don't see this study necessarily bringing back recommendations in, in terms of there's efficient use of technology but not necessarily efficient use of personnel um, and so I, I'm just concerned that the result is going to come back with a plan that doesn't necessarily focus on the efficient use of shared resources side of the equation it's more on the how do we provide the services, but also still maintain some level of service at the local level. And I, I, th I find that cha challenging to, to mm -hmm. see how that's going to end with a lot of communities saying, this is a financial win for us. Particularly if the, if the approach is to transfer all budgeted costs in year one, and yet there's still an expectation that there's going to be some level of local service provided. I don't know how that is supposed to work. Mm -hmm. um, so I would just say, I mean, I think these are important issues to study, and I think it's, to me, the big unanswered question is, how does this, how do we then go to our taxpayers and say, not only are you getting better service, but we're not duplicating services, um, and we're becoming more efficient in the way we approach dispatch. Mm -hmm. I've got a lot of experience with consolidation, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, it becomes exciting to add to the service provision side of things and less exciting to talk about what that might what it might look like in terms of eliminating you know duplicate services because mm -hmm. that means humans <laughs> so I don't I don't that's not that I don't support moving forward with the study but I would I would encourage the board to really dig into that mm -hmm. question. It feels like I know what I want to say. It feels like it could be a setup. Yeah. Like we're going to get this report and it's going to result in a pretty high price tag for mm -hmm. this. So a couple of points to make, and, and the, these are really things I've heard from the chief, so if I'm misspeaking here, correct me. So I think that's a, I think Rick and I share that concern, and one of the things that I heard the chief 
say often through the review process as we were looking at the consultants and, and sitting with the other chiefs from across the county is this is not we are not interested in how you coordinate six communities efforts we are interested in building a new thing right. and that the six communities will have to figure out how to adapt to that new thing um, and I think that that's something Rick really emphasized through the review process is a consultant who's just going to come in and put together binders of six different standard operating procedures isn't, isn't the effect we're looking for here. Um, I think the challenge for us specifically in Winooski is that we are the only department um, who is considering moving that doesn't have an administrative support for the police department or records retention clerk or something like that. So I think the challenge for us will be when calls, you know, our calls will be, if we go in this direction, the calls will be moved over, but in terms of preparing for court or working with our officers here or doing scheduling or parking ticket reconciliation or administrative tasks our dispatchers are currently doing that other dispatchers in the county are not doing because they have other administrative support, that's going to be the challenge for us. Mm -hmm. and, and Rick and I don't have good answers for that yet. Um, and likely won't until IXP has a model of, yes, they're going to do this part of the court tracking process, but they're not going to do that part. Or this works with officers in this way, the court system works with officers in this way, but, but needs dispatch support here. So I think that's going to be an ongoing conversation. And I think because we are the community that doesn't have that administrative support, um, Rick's really been carrying the mantle of, again, that this is not a collection of other processes that this independent body will now administer. This is a whole new thing. So we are very, we agree with you and are, um, and are very focused on, on thinking about that. Mm -hmm. That's good to hear. Did I capture that? Yeah. Sometimes I listen to you <laughs> and can say things back. <laughs> Well, it's important because any time a contractor comes in after responding to an RFP, sometimes they can take these things off in their own direction if there's not strong pushback and direction from the governing group, and the group that puts the bumpers on the bowling alley, right? And keeps them focused on what they're supposed to produce. It's actually productive. Good luck. Thanks. Uh, questions, concerns for Jesse and Chief on this? And I'm assuming we'll end up with some a presentation of some kind as this work progresses, an update. Okay. Absolutely. Questions, comments, concerns from the public? Okay. So seeing and hearing none, I'd entertain a motion for approval for the Chittenden County Public Safety Authority uh, fund balance allocation request. So, so moved. Second. Motion by House, second by Christine. Any further discussion? Seeing hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And those opposed, motion carries. Can Thanks for all your work on this. Yeah, thank you. Can we have a two minute break, please? Sure. Uh, we're going to take a two minute break. We'll reconvene at 8 12. Okay. Uh, we will now reconvene uh, our regular city council meeting and pick up the agenda where we left off, which will be starting with item H, which is the um, CIP. Preview, including debt service modeling. CIP, it's so exciting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, that, if the work you heard previously, sorry, I'm getting a little punch at 810, from Julie about the work she and Angela have led about this in the last six months, this is the equivalent on the public work side. It's super exciting. <laughs> I'm super excited Very about it. <laughs> I'm going to carry that. <laughs> I will stop now. Uh, so, CIP, so just to give kind of a general overview for the public, that is our five-year sort of outlook on capital asset planning uh, that goes over, you know, how do we procure, how do we finance, um, what are we replacing for our capital assets, and those are defined as having a useful life of three years, and through our city Winooski policy, there's thresholds for what uh, capital asset is. So, for example, infrastructure, anything over $20,000 would be considered a capital asset that would be included into the, the CIP program. So, what we're doing for FY20 is, is reorganizing the CIP, and I've provided sort of a, 
a summary cover sheet of how we're categorizing each asset class, um, sort of by infrastructure, fleet, facilities, and then with a more detailed breakdown of that category. Um, so this is, uh, you know, exciting, but behind it is, is even more exciting, I think, more exciting. So <laughs> that's where we get into really looking at each uh, asset classification. Uh, so for example, pavement, you know, we're not looking at five years, we're looking at every single street in Winooski, trying to plan out when are we gonna do a maintenance or paving or reconstruction activity on that street. Um, so we can't just look at you know five years for an asset like that. We have to look at the entire category, and then we also have to look at how that overlays with other assets. So you know our water infrastructure. Um, obviously, we want to overlay those you know replacements or work so that we're not you know paving a road and then coming back years later or a year later and doing a water main replacement. So I didn't give you the excerpt of our, our, our water main replacement, but we have a 20 year outlook for a water main replacement that you'll see for FY20 that will overlay with our you know, pavement, pavement asset um, work. So same with the fleet, uh, we've, we've gone out and we've looked at, we've categorized every you know, general fund fleet and kind of put our replacement year life cycle um, uh, figure for those. Um, and then same with facilities. We do have some more work to do with facilities looking at kind of the major components of so roofs, HVAC systems. We have some work there to look at, but um, we're, we'll have the majority of that filled in for FY20. So I think what I'm sort of looking for some feedback tonight is um, based on the summary sheet, you know, what kind of maybe information or additional information um, you all may find helpful for FY20. Um, we will be looking at including existing debt service as part of this, so you can kind of see categorically, you know, what we already have sort of, what we're already spending on um, for those, each of those assets. Uh, but that's, that's sort of what we're previewing here tonight is the organization of the, the CIP. So, so just to say that a slightly different way, um, you know, in the past, or last year, I don't know about historically, but last year, as part of the budget, you received a 10 or 15 page Excel sheet of all of our assets divided out over, over multiple years. So it was, it was hard to understand, I thought, what, what, these cate what we were spending on each category of infrastructure type. So John bring, brought his expertise from doing CIP planning in other communities and has built this model. Um, so, so as part of the FY20 budget process, you'll receive an entire CIP across general fund, water fund, wastewater funds. That's a lot of information. So we wanted to start giving you what this model looks like so you could become familiar with the spreadsheets and then understand how you know, these documents work together. So the document that looks like this, table one, is the cover sheet to the general fund CIP. All you will see on this sheet is the, not all you'll see, what you'll see on this sheet is the revenue, the different um, asset areas, what will be done in the years we're, we're specifically talking about. But behind each of these asset areas is detailed spreadsheets that categorize the entire fleet, every street in the city, every water line in the city, et cetera. And we can certainly dive down into those as part of the budget process, but want to kind of outline that process to you. Um, I think it might be helpful, John, if you just walk on table one, mm -hmm. specifically walk through, um, you know, maybe using the streets as the example, what each of these columns represent. Sure. So currently in the general fund um, CIP, I think we just have one line called street reconstruction. That's pretty much a catch-all for anything related to street work. So what we've done is, is break it out um, into the classifications that... Um, we actually perform work and we can assign an actual tag a street that we're going to be doing work on. So item one would be a full street reconstruction. So typically that happens hand in hand when we're doing utility repair work. So for this example, we're looking at Hickok Street, potentially for FY20. Um, so we're firming up some numbers on the general fund side. 
but that's mainly going to be a water main replacement project. Um, item two would be a, a rehab, so that's what you would typically see, like uh, where you come through and you mill and fill back an inch and a half of pavement. Um, that gives the, the street another, say, 15 years of life expectancy. Um, so that's our most typical kind of pavement project that we do throughout the city. And then um, one that I'm hoping we can start um, providing a little additional funding to is, is really pavement preservation type work. So that's a lower cost um, main act activity, but it'll extend the life of pavement, say another five years. And it, it's the, the idea of keeping good roads in, in good condition. Um, so we're not getting to that, you know, stage two rehab. Um, we can push that out maybe another five or 10 years, uh, which is a little more expensive. And then streetscape would be kind of a catch-all for anything, um, paver replacements, uh, for example, East Allen, Winooski Falls Way, there's, there's some downtown pavers popping. Um, that would be a typical project in, say, the streetscaping category. And then other transportation work, so that would be looking at Main Street, doing some joint repair replacements right at the, the top of the circulator. And then, of course, we have, you know, we've got three bridges here in Winooski. Um, we're currently reviewing, right now there's nothing that's, uh, significant level CIP work for the you know Main Street Bridge and Weaver Street Bridge but we're tracking we're gonna be tracking that further to see if we should be starting to set money aside for any um, you know major repair work in the future um, and then um, traffic signals and street lighting are the other two sort of infrastructure related pieces we um, we we are we have an analysis going on right now through uh, East Coast Signals, one of our consultants, that they're analyzing all our traffic signals to see, you know, what level of service are they in? Is there any, you know, immediate repair needs? Um, what should we be budgeting out in the next couple of years for potentially replacement of equipment? So that will also be included in this FY20. So that takes us through the philosophical underpinnings of why you put these things where they are, which is really great. Could you guys walk through the columns, like the column headers, and explain what you, each column is? Sure. And especially for recognition that the two of you didn't see the old sheet either, or, or approach it in any kind of past way with how we chunk, you know, reserve expenditures out and how we budget for the capital budget. We'll just start by saying that the capital budget's funded separately, right? So there's a special set aside in our tax rate that funds the capital budget that's got a little escalator in it from year to year. So there's a set amount of funds that's coming into there. And then it is its own separate budget item that's planned out over time. It's not baked into the public works, you know, general operations mm -hmm. budget. Mm -hmm. It's set aside for those capital projects, which is really well explained here. I just wanted to verbalize that as we start that since we're not in budget mode yet. But I think if, if you could talk through, I think really the number one thing, so talk about the allocated GF capital piece and then work down into the columns and defining what, what those mean when you say reserve balances, FY20 total project cost, and FY20 reserve allocation, and then what the years. That would be really helpful. Sure. So above the allocated general fund capital, um, that is, I believe, by resolution, mm -hmm. um, the amount that's set aside from the general fund to the capital reserve fund. So uh, these numbers have not been uh, vetted by Angelina. <laughs> so take that into consideration. But that's, this is the projected set aside, say for FY20, that 431,000. Um, and then the additional capital funds, uh, that is, I believe, annually. Yeah, that's the dedicated fund you were talking about. Yeah. So. Moving down to the main sort of uh, body of spreadsheet, so the reserve balance for so those are funds that you know they've been budgeted previous years and have been carried forward. So uh, these are again they need to be vetted by Angela, but that's what we were showing on the FY19 budgets. I've I've broken them out a little bit based on you know breaking them into categories. 
And then what we're showing is the FY, the next column over is the FY20 total project cost. So what is that project gonna cost um, without any you know, reserve fund use? And then the following column is the allocated reserve fund from the balance board. And then you have the five years of fiscal year planning. <coughs> yeah. So the, the idea here is trying to balance the use of reserves against the increase, a potential increase or expenditure of the existing tax rate and how you plan for that expenditure over five years. So for example, and again, not looking at these numbers, um, these aren't necessarily the, the quote unquote right numbers, mm -hmm. but if you look at three, for example, we have 20, so street preservation, we have 20,000 in reserves, a total project cost of 24.6, so in this line, we're, we would be recommending the use of 10,000 of those set aside reserves and then the balance in the FY20 tax rate allocation. And then you'll see that in future years, we're rec recommending each year we reinvest 25,000 additional money into that preventative maintenance target area. So that's how you can kind of see how that we're trying to build that model of how we're going to invest in our infrastructure year to year and then also call out what we're actually going to do with that money so we can start saying to the public, yes, we know your street is a pavement condition index of 69. We're not doing it this year, but here's where it would be on a schedule out a couple of years and, and communicating that back to the public so they understand that there's a plan. Yeah, each one of those, so right now, we, you know, we show 25,000, but each one of those will be des designated a street and the actual budget um, that we've, that we've um, kind of estimated based on some pavement escalation numbers. An interesting thing we're starting to, to look at is kind of displaying that to the public. Um, so, you know, with the new website, one of the things we're exploring is you know, working with CCRPC and creating a, a module on the website that shows a map where, you know, folks can kind of click on and see, you know, five-year capital plan, here are the streets that we are looking at potentially doing the next five years. Um, just a real easy display to show folks where that funding could be going. And just one more reminder on this and then we can move on to the debt modeling unless there are other questions. We are building these CIPs outside of the Main Street and pool process. Ultimately, of course, those will be integrated fully into the <coughs> citywide CIP and the related debt service. Um, but as we made the commitment through the Main Street project not to use our, our existing CIP needed for all of this other infrastructure dedicated to that, we are really focusing on the build out of that separate from those two capital projects. And I think, should note also, um, John has been vetting this structure with the Public Works Commission as well. Um, and so they've seen a lot of this and, and helped inform how, what these models look like. I think it's gonna take a little practice with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a, it's a huge leap with two feet in the right direction, personally. Um, just looking at it, it's much more, it's more meaningful, the information that's here and gives us more actual information that helps inform what the pace of investment looks like. Um, I think that that's really good. I think one thing, I think having access to the roll up is great and keeps it simple. I think having what I like to call the Angela sheet um, available too is also really important. And because I like to look at the Angela sheet um, and get into that level of detail when we get to the budget time. Um, it's not always necessary and needed. But I think the big thing that that will do that the, the way we did the last time as cumbersome as it was is also flag any large capital projects because of our limited budget that we're not funding, that we should be aware of, that we are <coughs> acknowledging that we are ignoring. Because what we used to do is just put them on there and, and then have an expense down the road and be like, well, and by the way, we're not putting any money towards this, right? This is just functionally where is the money going? And I think this is a more meaningful exercise. But I think somewhere we need to bridge, we need to have that opportunity to acknowledge what we're not funding from a capital perspective too, if that makes sense. Maybe that's a memo of you're at the top 
you know, 10 things that we are most concerned about that we're not funding that we think are lingering in the background that you should be aware of. Um, or, you know, maybe it's just having that detail available. I don't know. That was, when looking at this, that was my initial thinking. I think this is so much more clearly organized. Um, the other thing I was, I was going to do is with these FY20 projects is actually create sort of a project sheet for each of them to, it gives a better description mm -hmm. instead of just having, you know, a, a line item here and actually tells like, okay, this is what we're doing. This is what the project is. Um, this is the financial tool we're using to, you know, fund it and that sort of thing. More in depth for, for each one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, in government, they call that in lapis, like lapis in the federal government the, is the word that's used if you do funding notifications, too. If you're going to do funding sheets, I think it would be great, and you guys are already doing a great job of this, but anytime there's a capital expenditure of any kind, having a small write-up of it, even if it's not a big deal on face in the grand scope and scheme of your projects, to get in the habit of putting those into a, a standardized format and putting them online is really huge for people to be able to see what was done in addition to seeing that plan yeah. ahead. Even if it's $80,000 on the signage, you know, to make sure the public's aware that that occurred from a notification standpoint. Sorry, Nicole. Well, I, th I think um, like an illust, I don't know that, uh, um, I need a, a, it would help. I don't think it would. I need a in-depth write-up of every project, although that may have other uses. But will be very useful. Would be sort of an Ill, a case illustration. So this road, you know, this is what's been put into the reserve balance allocated to this function over time. This is the total cost of the project. Just to help people understand how to read the chart because it is a new way of looking at the information. Yeah. Um, I think, and I process information better when I can see it rather than when I can hear it. So I appreciate your t talking us through it, but I'm still like, well, what does that actually mean for Hickok Street <laughs> or, or whatever? So thanks. Other feedback, questions, concerns? Go ahead, Jesse. This is really, this is exactly what we want for tonight is just to, it is, it is a lot of information. So we didn't want to give you the whole thing on one night and be like, all right, <laughs> done. Any questions? I tried to think about it. Some of it's going to take, I think, one year yeah. application. I, like I said, I think regardless of what happens, you can tell all the effort, energy, and thought that went into it and that it's a huge, huge improvement right off the bat. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's meant to be a living document, so it'll, you know, get, more refined and, and as much detail as needed to kind of get the point across. So, any feedback you have after this, you know, let us know. What's up with this thing? <laughs> so, this is uh, model number ten. Ten. <laughs> Lost track. So, really, what we're we're doing is, um, you know, we've we've refined it to include some additional information that we've received since the last time we presented. But I think the main point we're, we're trying to look at here is with FY20 looming, um, the main revenue factor uh, for FY20 is that local options tax. So I think, you know, besides giving you sort of an update of this debt model, which I'm sure will be updated again as we get, you know, even more information, um, I think what we're trying to do is, is uh, get some feedback on that lo local options tax resident revenue piece. As to whether we think it's a good idea or whether we think it's appropriately <laughs> So, So at our next meeting, we will be bringing you an FY20 budget, and yeah. that FY20 budget will reflect revenue streams and expenditure streams. and these two project these two so we just talked about the cip and our regular infrastructure planning this is the other half of that equation we've been talking about this a lot um so we're we're trying to take your temperature a little on given what we've heard from you i.e move quickly ahead with a pool we now have an engineering contract where we've had the kickoff meeting we're running full steam into 
full design on that in anticipation of taking out a bond anticipation note this spring and then a uh, bond in the summer to pay for the construction starting next year, et cetera, et cetera. Same thing on the Main Street side to do the full engineering all at once is a fairly large contract. Um, it will require expenditure of that debt in FY20. Um, and here's the model right now. Here is the model we are looking at building into the FY20 budget that includes a lot of ex assumptions. For example, tolerance to go to the public and ask for local options, rooms, meals, and alcohol, and sales tax. And then at the bottom, what the tax rate increases, which is 4.6% in FY20, including those revenue streams. And if there's not appetite to do that, we, we can build, you know, we can present other options. Um, that's what we're trying to take the temperature on. Is that tax rate impact comfortable? Not saying you have to vote, say yes tonight, but are we in the right ballpark? Are you comfortable with those revenue streams? And remind us of what we had in the budget memo discussed last time in terms of of expected natural appreciation of current operations under current operation status we were at what percent from the increased perspective for the operations for the fy20 budget outside of this yes you said cola which right now is 2.8 i don't think we'll bring you in something that high i think we said level sir you said service. level service no new ads cola right I, w I was thinking that previous to the conversation we had batted around two ish, mm -hmm. so two two point five seems with cola and mm -hmm. natural increase of cost of goods. Um, so we'd be looking at close to seven mm -hmm. combined. Am I reading that this spring we're going to Beyond FY21, the model anticipates no additional annual rates of increase, or is that just we haven't put the numbers in yet? <coughs> so what we assumed is that that revenue from the tax rate increase would carry forward, and that there would not there would be a one and a half percent increase in this model for FY21 to cover some you know, the full bond amount of the Main Street project. But once that sort of revenue was generated, uh, there wouldn't be a need to increase. The right, taxes. it's not a one-year bump up to 1.12. It's a... It maintains state. in the tax rate. But we're not doing every year more and more, other than cost of increases to the general fund budget. Or other, yeah, right? whatever so, other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But assuming those, I mean, the, the problem with this, the problem with presenting lots of models like this to you is that there are lots of decision points baked into each line of this. So yes, that's right. Assuming that, for example, in FY22, you're comfortable with those two, sale, those two local options taxes and a Main Street set aside and implementing impact fees. So see those revenue lines on three, four, on... <coughs> on the mm -hmm. three yep. box and the four box. Mm -hmm. So each of those require another decision point. Right, mm -hmm. like the TIF funding set aside. Right, exactly. So, I mean, so when we get this out- This is really different though than the last numbers we saw. I mean, from an increase, a tax base increase perspective. I think on the last one we assumed, I think we didn't carry that revenue forward on the last model. It was 13% last time. So it's 13% if there's no new revenues. Yeah. If there's no offsetting revenues. Right. And are, ben, all, are we essentially capturing all of the new revenue that may be out there? Um, that's what we're attempting to do. If right. you have other ideas, for we are projects. all ears. <laughs> for, for these projects, and there's a phasing yes. to it. Yes. Also. So yes. Main Street's happening over two phases rather than all at once. Right. Um, and what's the 50% TIF funding set aside? So does that mean that 50% of the funds coming in from the TIF at that <coughs> point could be available for other purposes? Right. 
We're so not consuming, it, sorry, the entirety of the TIF exactly. revenue. Exactly. And then it steps down, you'll see, over time as well. So mm -hmm. one of the things, um, so in box one, um, in phase two for Main Street, you see the debt not picking up until FY25, i.e. when the TIF expires. Um, and then using that TIF set aside, so in FY25, assuming all goes well, we'll have about $1.2, $1.3 million returning to the general fund. So what we're, the decision point of this line is, do you want to future commit 50% of that revenue to this debt service and then step it down over time as outlined? Mm -hmm. I, you know, when I looked at this, the the thing that I did was circle the um, the places where I thought there was the most vol potential volatility in the modeling um, as to where to try to identify the risk. And I think, you know, for me, it's, it's four, right? It's the items grouped mm -hmm. in four. Um, with that being said, there are also not the largest sources of funds. So I I just, when I looked at this, I went in with a plus or minus a percent, you know, attitude um, when it came to <coughs> both of these tax impacts and the zeros further on. Mm -hmm. um, you know, personally, I walked away. Th I mean, this is tremendous from a just general perspective if these actually come to fruition, this is tremendously good news and is a very vastly different revenue um, picture than I think we started with. I know it is, because I tried to pull back some of those other ones and understand where my disconnect was coming from the tax rate perspective, but I guess I'm, I found those margin errors to be pretty comfortable when it comes to four and was not the concern with that. And then I guess I, I'll just philosophically say that I think we invested in creating the TIF to create infrastructure that would help the city grow and thrive. And it's done that. It's done its job and it's gonna create revenue, a revenue source now that I think the responsible thing to do with it is to reinvest it in the, that same line of, uh, of investment. Uh, because, but for us doing that, our city would be in a really vastly different place financially. Um, and from a sustainability standpoint, who knows what it would look like here. Um, so I think trying to double down on that investment to do a very similarly um, purposed um, project is is exactly what that morally to me calls for. Um, and to not just have it dwindled into operations eventually, etc. I think reinvesting in hardscape is the right thing to do. Because that's how it got there that's how that egg was created so i agree with the tiff modeling is that's a long way of saying that um i also i feel similarly that reinvesting part of that makes sense and is the logical thing to do with some of that money i like we can get into like numbers later i don't know half seems fine to me offhand um i do want to discuss the local options tax though you know, we've talked about this before that we, I think we've said that we're pretty much on board with support from the community. It's already kind of been voted for before. But I recall discussing a 1% increase, and I, I don't know this offhand, but I believe that's what we are surrounded by. Oh, sorry, that's my fault. <laughs> so these all are 1%, the 2% is year to year growth. So assuming 2% okay. increase in the revenue, it is all 1%. So it's a 1%. It's a 1% local, local option tax on rooms, meals, and alcohol, and a 1% local and that's option tax on sales. Are actually allowed. Yeah, we're not okay. legally allowed to do anymore. Yeah. I thought we were doubling that suddenly. No, no, no. We're just assuming that receipts it's will more. increase by 2% a year. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. How many numbers? I support a local options sales tax for rooms, meals, and alcohol, and would like to see that move forward. I don't support a local options general sales tax. Can 
Can you speak to your feelings behind that? Yeah, I think in general, I think sales tax is something that's pretty regressive. That hits people who are less economically enfranchised harder um, than it does people who have more spending money. To me, it's more palatable if it's stuff like rooms, meals, and alcohol, which is generally, that's money people are spending out of an expendable budget. Whereas if we're taxing toilet paper and tuna fish, that doesn't feel, that doesn't feel right to me. Um, and I know it's not significant. You know, it's, you can look at you know, three cents on a can of beans and be like, that's not significant. But having watched when I, you know, like, you know, a lot of my neighbors going in and buying a can of beans with pocket change, like it, it has a significant impact on people. So it's just something I can't get on board with. Is there any ability to carve out groceries? I mean, there's, I, I don't believe a, there's a sales tax on food. Yeah, because we have a lot of like boutiques in town or high-end mm -hmm. services that I would not want to exempt those particular businesses from contributing to the infrastructure needs of the community. I thought apply the general. If they're not, if they're not. Um, a restaurant basically. I mean, we're basically hitting the restaurants and potentially the hotel and not the, the new crop of businesses that's growing. So, um, if this is something that we move forward, we I will provide you. We didn't provide for you today a comprehensive overview of what's included and what's not included. Mm -hmm. um, or a historic breakdown of this over time. Um, I will, we will be sure to do that in advance of any mm -hmm. vote. Um, this is, this is more a like, yes, we would entertain a conversation <clears throat> or no, don't, don't bring it to us. And I, the tax department issues an almost annual clarification memo yep. on this because there's always something new that some people are taxing and other people aren't. I can tell you property management, for example, is one of those things. It's been a big thing where some cities apply it to that and some don't, and it's been a fight back and forth. So it's a bit of a moving target. So I think some education on that would be great. Because yeah. we've spent time on the rooms, meals, and alcohol um, piece, but less time on the sort of general barter sales. There's In the end, we're talking about revenue needing to come from somewhere. So it's if it's not there, it's going to get, go back into this bottom line property tax impact. And I think, too, that's then is going to become the, the conversation because I, I don't like hitting anybody with taxes, but it's I'm trying to find that balance. So maybe having a better understanding of what its actual ramifications would be on exactly what goods. And mm -hmm. or services because there are some services that are considered transactional. I don't know if it's, right. it's complicated. But I you think you know somebody at the tax department. <laughs> I may have used him last week. Um, the a huge caveat to this as well, and I and I we're not going to have clarity. I don't think on this the impact of this to Winooski yet. Um, is that with the new cloud taxation, the sales ta local option sales tax also applies to anything that's delivered to Winooski, um, and that and that just started. So in, when I look at the receipts data, you know the numbers that are based here are based on the receipts from FY18. Um, those weren't included. Um, you know the Amazon deliveries weren't included in those receipts, mm -hmm. um, and we're not going to have a good projection of that. Mm -hmm. At this, for another whole year, mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if that would increase this sales tax number by twenty percent or by a hundred percent. It's how much Amazon delivers, or you know, also, you know what I'm saying about the cloud taxation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that would be nice is if you could just make mention of Airbnb um, and our ability to capture taxes on that so the airbnbs are do um 
are taxed from a rooms, meals, and alcohol perspective, but again, that hasn't got that hasn't been in place long enough to see reflected in the receipts. So right now, if you look at the rooms, meals, and alcohol receipts data on the tax department website for FY18, mm -hmm. there is no rooms tax collected in Winooski because we have no hotels, right. and they hadn't implemented yet with Airbnb. Um, so we that's again an unknown, okay. similar. I can't think of any other additional sources of money. I mean, other than the other thing we've talked about before is a, a taxi or car service registration fee to operate within the city's confines, <coughs> which Burlington runs a registration program. And we've kicked around this concept of a joint regional thing to do that in case you want to do another regionalization project just on the fly. <laughs> Um, what is that? Red. Yeah, so uh, vehicle service, a uh, vehicle service registration tax. So it requires anybody doing a car or vehicle for hire to pay a, a registration uh, for your tax. Uh, or something. Taxi. Okay. Yeah, and so there is one in Burlington, right? They have to pay a licensing tax. I think my gut has always been that that's an arbitrary thing for enforcement. It's not a money maker because the work that needs to be done to set it up is probably a net negative, but I just throw that out in the course of these taxes. To, it might be something worth a quick look. I, I think that is interesting to think about for down the line. I wouldn't particularly be interested in discussing that at the same time as the yeah. timeline. Yeah, it's a whole other work project. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I find this number to be f pretty palpable given what we're talking about doing. And I find the revenue structure to be generally something that I'm, I, I agree that answering some of those questions about the sales tax is gonna be good. Are there other things that we need to be brought back to inform this discussion better? I just have a clarifying question about the, the revenue for the pool. It's it's a a constant uh, figure. Is that just uh, the fifteen year period divided by fifteen? Why wouldn't that show any kind of? I have a spreadsheet that calculates that. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. <laughs> Back up. Um, we did not update the revenues from the pool from the last model. I can send you that that pool revenue projection. Um, I think that is, I think what we were trying to do is be conservative mm -hmm. with the revenues on that, and we did not um, put enough inflation factor on it, but I can okay. send you that data. No, I'll still out too. The other thing you do by not going over 50% in the TIF is if you have to hit something in an emergency situation where one of these other revenue streams fail, that you've got that. Other, when the finances add up. other questions, comments, concerns, or items that could help inform this conversation for the next time it comes to us? I think the res resulting resounding commentary is that you guys did really great work with both of these things and spreadsheets, and thank you very much. Thank Way you. to dominate Excel. <laughs> <laughs> questions, comments, concerns from the public? It's really fun to listen to John and Angela talk. <laughs> okay. I love Excel. <laughs> okay, item I, FY policy uh, priorities and strategy update, economic vitality. Thanks for visiting, John. Thank Thanks, John. Hello. So being that it is 10 of 9, um, I, I would love to hear from you. Um, if there are specific things within the memo that I have given to you that you would like to hear me talk about, I did have a plan that involved going over um, progress on the three priority strategies and then a brief discussion of the Winooski Small Business Loan, but I am open to whatever would work best for you this evening. Mm -hmm. 
May I make a suggestion? Yeah, please. Um, because our next meeting is really going to be focused on the TIF Global Settlement, which includes parking and the TIF build out. Mm -hmm. We skip those. Mm -hmm. You have the updates here in front of you. I would like Heather to share the analysis she's done on the local parcel, mm -hmm. parcel business parcel data analysis that we talked about in the strategy, and then the small business loan program. Yeah. I think if we just hit those two, those are kind of the new things. Is that Great. Those were the two things I would most want to talk about, so great. Um, okay, so I have completed the parcel analysis for downtown and the gateway businesses, and I really want to make the point that that's not all the businesses in the city, and especially that some of our largest employers are up on Tigan, that's about a third of the total citywide jobs up on Tigan. So we are not talking about all of the businesses. but. Um, in looking at local ownership, I found that we have 21% through downtown and the gateways that are Winooski-based ownership, 84% Chittenden County ownership, and 95% Vermont ownership. So we do have a high percentage of locally owned business in the city. Um, I think it's really important that we balance our efforts on both maintaining those opportunities for the small entrepreneurs um, to start businesses, for local residents to start businesses, but also to maintain those employment opportunities <clears throat> that may not be locally owned, but are opportunities for our residents as well. Um, so I've given you a few recommended resources that I would say would be useful in creating opportunities for locally owned business startups. Um, one of them is, the first one is uh, supporting a co-working space that's looking to come into the community. And one of the reasons behind that is because we actually have a really high percentage of Winooski workers who work from home. It's 7.4%, which is a lot higher than Chittenden County, which is I think 4.9 or something like that. And Burlington is 3.3. .3. So it's an unusually high percentage. Um, I'll talk with you in a few minutes about possible revisions to the Winooski Small Business Loan Program to better utilize the funds. I think we should be hosting some of our partner organizations to bring together um, Small Business Development Center, SCORE, CBOEO, Women's Small Business Program, and Center for Women and Enterprise to have workshops in the community. Um, so instead of in reinventing the wheel here, I can bring in partners and offer those opportunities to our community. I would certainly recommend creating a business startup guide. Ultimately, I would like that to be an online, something that's online as well on our new website. Uh, in Syracuse, I did an annual retail recruitment event, um, and that was where I pulled together um, all of the businesses that had expressed any interest in coming into Syracuse, as well as lending institutions, leasing agents, business owners, so that they could tell about their successes. Um, Downtown Organization, um, SCORE, SBA, and other small business development partners as well as city staff. So you could kind of, it was, you know, one-stop shopping. Um, so I would recommend doing something along that line. Providing a commercial space locator on the economic development page of the website, although right now I mean, it's pretty easy because there aren't that many spaces, so mm -hmm. I kind of have them in my head. But having that available online, so someone at 3 o'clock in the morning thinking about wanting to start a business doesn't rule out when you ski because they can't look us up. Um, providing support to businesses throughout the Main Street project. And also, I would recommend that um, I'd like to attend a, a economic development, an International Economic Development Council training, entrepreneurial and small business development strategies this year. So those are my baseline beginning um, recommendations. If any of you are interested in how um, the local business parcel analysis breaks down um, based on different gateways or the downtown or any of that, I have that information as well. Happy to share it. Could you? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Um, so downtown businesses are 15% Winooski based. 79% uh, Chittenden County ownership and 97% Vermont ownership. East Allen Gateway businesses are 9% Winooski based, 91% Chittenden County and 91% Vermont ownership. Mallets Bay Ave has the highest Winooski based ownership and the highest Vermont ownership at 33% uh, Winooski based, 83% Chittenden County, Chittenden County based and 100% Vermont ownership. Hmm. 
Um, Main Street Gateway businesses break down as 29% Winooski based ownership, 87% Chittenden County, and 94% Vermont ownership. So I'm going to move on, if that's okay, to the uh, small business loan program discussion. Mm -hmm. um, at this point, I have um, recommended that, if, actually now it's 10 businesses, it was eight, it was at the time that I wrote this, but um, 10 potential businesses or existing businesses uh, apply for the Winooski Small Business Loan Program. Only one of those was eligible for that program because we can only fund tier three loans based on the way that the memorandum of understanding was written. So we can do buy downs of the lower risk loans at tier one and tier two, but it's really only the highest risk loans that even get to our program for consideration. If they qualify for those higher tier loans and they're just funded through Opportunities Credit Union. So my recommendation would be that we move forward and talk with the um, small Business Loan Committee about the possibility of coming back with a recommendation for you for a certain percentage of the funds that are made available for interest rate buy-downs specifically, which would then make all Winooski businesses, regardless of what their credit history is, in some way eligible for the program. So anything coming through would then be considered for the Winooski Small Business Loan Program if it's a Winooski business. Um, well, we'll get to that when we get there. I think it's great that you guys are thinking about it. We'll Just something that I'd like to discuss with the committee and come mm -hmm. back with a recommendation. I don't mm -hmm. have a specific percentage in mind, but I wanted to touch base with you and see what your appetite was for us to look at that. Because right now, we're not using it to support business at all. It's just sitting. So. Right. And previously, there was a council that wanted to hold very tightly um, to the idea that the money needs needed to regenerate itself, mm -hmm. which in a situation where you're just buying down interest, it doesn't. Right. It goes out the it's door. It's a direct cost. But we have money to spend it. It's <laughs> always been kind of the balancing conversation discussion. So. Yeah, and that's why I would recommend a percentage of it, so we know some of it is still revolving, mm -hmm. but you know, there's a certain amount that we're willing to. That's great. Yeah. What do you think the demand is for such? I think if we were doing interest rate buy downs, we would have more takers on that. Um, I definitely think there are some businesses that would have been interested in that, but knowing that they're eligible for a tier one loan and you know would just end up with an opportunities loan, they're not as interested in going for yeah. that program. So um, if you go earlier to the memo, yeah. the, the Council's priorities and policies mm -hmm. discussion where we talked about using rate city resources. Yeah. Um, to create employment opportunities for residents and expand availability of goods and services for residents. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'd be interested in, I'm, I have a, I guess, a philosophical issue with making public funds available to any small business owner without consideration of the public good. Mm -hmm. So I would want to see some connect, connect. So we, right now we tied it to risk or you know the inability to secure right. financing because right. your credit wasn't. Um, and maybe that wasn't the right criteria to look at, but I don't, I don't feel comfortable abandoning all criteria and just say <coughs> first come, first serve if you're, no matter whether you're a uh, high end, mm -hmm. you know, serving, you know, whatever, providing goods and services that, uh, you know, are available to a small slice of the community versus, mm -hmm. um, the, you know, what we heard through that process where, you know, members of the community have certain businesses that they are really feeling a need for. Um, and so, how do we make that connection between public funding for some shared public good? We do still have the criteria mm -hmm. that are used to evaluate the loans. Yeah. So I think those criteria, and I, I don't have them in front of me, yeah. I apologize for that, but um, those criteria would still apply to the interest rate buy-downs, or at least that's the way I'm imagining it. So okay. we've already established that it has to be meeting these certain needs in the community. So higher scoring interest rate buy-downs would then be eligible. Okay. We could even set some, 
see that together. Yeah, yeah. Because that was a while ago. <laughs> yeah, it's been, yeah, that was March. So. Yeah. yeah, the scoring matrix. And if you go with that model where that's prioritized, we might want to think about an open season, and cl an open and closed date for it, sure. an RFP. I mean, I don't know, I'm just throwing ideas to yeah. be on that. I was also just going to say, too, if the committee thinks that they need to, to get to use it, you know, the state's done a lot of analysis recently on revolving loan funds and come back with the conclusion that grant a portion of grant injection is necessary to get most of the RLFs to go, the revolving loan funds to be used. Mm -hmm. um, so the state is now um, putting grant funding into almost all of the revolving loan funds that it's utilizing for housing and economic development. That's great. And that's something mm -hmm. that just changed like last year and this year. That's great. Um, so they're saying basically to get people to take the fifteen thousand dollars in loan, we need to give three thousand dollars in a grant. You know, so yeah. if they wanna, if they have got good reasoning and ration through that, when they start to review this, um, to propose something like that, I just we might not go for it, um, but I would encourage them to think outside the box and how we get the mm -hmm. funds utilized too. Great, thank you. Not feel wed to this because this was just something I threw together. <laughs> Uh, what else? That's helpful. I think that gives us some Yeah, that guidance. absolutely uh, gives us forward. some guidance. And it, it's something, the grant percentage is something I'm familiar with in um, Syracuse, and we might have specific things that we want to incentivize with that. So, for example, we could have that percentage be a facade grant or, you know, something mm -hmm. that would provide a direct benefit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When previously, for example, Opportunities was able to pair a revolving loan fund through one entity with a grant fund from a Yackel Foundation that provided upfront grant injection towards new American families that were purchasing farming equipment to work with new farms for new Americans right. and to order cash machines and registered management, business management tools. So they took a loan, but there was also a grant component too. Yeah. It was huh. really helpful. What else? Uh, so just to speak highly of a partner, and I'm sorry, and I will disclose I used to work there, but if you haven't been to Opportunities webpage recently, you should go there tonight after work because I think like the five major um, businesses that they've, they're they highlighting from a funding perspective are all Winooski businesses, um, which is pretty cool. That's, that is an entity that the city fought very hard to get to come in here and it's yielded some good results. This is a great job on the update overall, too. Thank you for all your work, and I know it's not reflective of the housing work and everything else that's going on, so I really appreciate all the, all the thought that went into it and the work that's been done. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions, comments, concerns for Heather and Jesse on the economic vitality report? Okay, so top two take backs for St. Michael's class. What are they going to be? We've done Okay, that concludes tonight's uh, regular agenda. I entertain a motion to adjourn. Mm -hmm. Motion by Nicole, second by Eric. Any further discussion? Seeing and hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And those opposed? Motion carries. <laughs>